got to put a best of on Drew. We're going to lose every station we have. This thing sucks. Who is your daddy and what does he do? End of day. The freedom of speech is being taken away. What do you think happens after they die? Uh, I, do you believe in heaven? Whatever. End of days, the judgment day, the end of the world. If you don't friend. And welcome to a brand new life, to a brand new day, all the way from the wastelands of California. My name is Michael, and I look forward to once again serve you those sounds of salvation. First time listeners, turn on, tune in, and drop out. This is a very different kind of show, a place where you don't feel so alone. Let us chase away the light no matter what you at home choose to believe. I do admire you for your curiosity. Live and direct right now on the TuneIn Radio app. Search End of Days and you'll find the 24-7 network. Of course, you can go to MichaelDeacon.com if you care to interact with me or other listeners just like yourself. Once again, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for allowing me into your hearts and into your minds. Here we are again on a night like this. My guest this evening is Joanne Richards. She is the executive director of educational nonprofit Earth Defense Headquarters. Her husband, Mark Richards, and his father, Alice Lloyd Richards, were involved with top-level military intelligence operations since World War II. Many of these operations included on-world and off-world contact and battles with various alien species. Joanne has been a guest on several radio and television programs. She continues to lecture all around the nation. On the second half of the program, another soul joins us live, John Olson. My goodness, folks, thank you so much for being here. Truly excited. It's been a hell of a week. PayPal bans Alex Jones saying he promoted hate. Definitely not a good week for Mr. Jones. And, of course, my heart goes out to all those folks out there who lost their family, their friends during that horrible, horrible storm. Now, tonight will be a bit of a rattlesnake, folks. We have a tremendous show this evening. I'm truly, truly excited. Here we are together again, folks, like a big, happy, dysfunctional family, very much like those Thanksgiving dinners we so love. Now, I believe my guest is ready to go. Let's patch her through. Joanne, are you alive? I'm here. I'm so sorry I made you wait so long. It's okay. I feel so awful. Why? Oh, I made you wait. You know, I had to talk all this nonsense before bringing you on. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> yes. No problem. So, Joanne, I have to say it's incredible to finally talk to you again. You were on oh, this, thank you. You were on the program the very first episode. Oh, that's right. Isn't that amazing? That is. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, no problem. I really did enjoy our conversations together. And, of course, yeah. I did enjoy seeing you at the conference, Alien Con, many moons ago. Oh, okay. <laughs> the, the one in uh, Santa Clara? Right. Okay. Amazing cool. time, yes. So, Joanne, before we begin, there's so much to go into with you here tonight. And as a preamble, I, I wanted to discuss your background which I okay. find to be completely amazing. And, of course, where you stand in terms of disclosure as well as humanity and the afterlife, that's just some of the things I did want to discuss with you here. Okay. Where do we start? Well, let's take us uh, back to your roots, per se. Um, were, uh -huh. you, were you always involved and interested in these sort of subjects when, let's say, in your adolescence and later in your adult years? When exactly was it for you? Yeah, no, it wasn't really till after I met Mark and he got me interested in it because, you know, I, I may have mentioned this before. I watched Martian movies, you know, growing up in the 50s and that, you know, that was fun and silly and that was cool, but I never took it seriously. And then, you know, life went on and I never really thought about it again until, you know, Mark started introducing his material to me. So, and then I was all in. <laughs> oh, yes. Didn't take long. Right. So a better question is, when exactly was it when you met? Mark? Right. We met in September of 1997. We started writing, 
And then we met in person a couple months later, that Thanksgiving of that year. And, you know, so 1997, fall of 1997, and we courted for five years and have been married now for 16 years. Wow. That is yeah. amazing. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> I truly believe so. And, of yeah. course, we discussed this on the very first episode. I asked how your family and your friends kind of took the sin and they weren't too happy, were they? They were not happy at all. My daughter cried, and my sisters, you know, everybody was just kind of dumbfounded. Because I, at first I was just talking about this guy who sounded like this great guy, and he is. And I didn't really tell them the prison part at first because I, you know, didn't want to know what they had to say. Right. And then I, when it was time to meet him, I said, well, i got to cut my Thanksgiving visit short because I'm going to go meet this guy in prison that I've been writing. <laughs> and they pretty much <laughs> dropped their teeth. And, and, and they were sure that it was going to ruin my family relationships. So it's like it hasn't because I still go to a lot of the family, you know, the family functions. There's been very few holidays that I've missed and um, things like that. So it, it's worked out, and at first they didn't really want to hear anything about him, and and now uh, I can talk openly about him, and, and they ask about him, and, you know, they're interested in prison conditions, and, you know, we bring up the UFO stuff, and they're okay with that. So some of my some of my nieces and nephews don't necessarily want to talk about it, but um, but my sister and her husband are very open to, and they've come to hear me speak once, so. It's all good. <laughs> That's good. I'm glad that they are slowly opening opening yeah. up to you because yeah. I know that is sort of a hard pill to swallow, especially It if, is. Esp- yeah, especially if you hear about this person and then you find out well they're in prison and then the mind yeah. races and then they want to protect you. Right. Yeah. Right. I understand. Well, you know, we I I would have probably would have grown up in and most people probably grow up in like, you know, in the environment that if you're in prison you must be guilty. So that's kind of the mindset, and so it's it's taken me a while. And I don't know if they truly believe he's not guilty or not. Um, I do, but, you know, it's like they don't give me a bad time, and they do talk about him, you know, just, you know, he's a part of my life, so that's what it is, and they don't, you know, give me any grief about it, so. I'm really glad they don't. Yeah. Because yeah, most families do. are definitely not like that. Pardon me? I said most families would not be that accepting. Right. You're right. You're right. And, you know, my grandkids have grown up knowing Grandpa. You know, they didn't know right away that he was in prison, but they're all old enough to know that, and they're very sympathetic. And, you know, they've, a couple of them have talked to Grandpa on the phone, and, uh, you know, they would like to meet him. So um, it's, you know, it's just a little hard to make that happen. But I know. Again, that's truly amazing. And I know where Vacaville Prison is. Oh, good. Oh, I know where that's at. <laughs> <laughs> right. I know exactly where that's at. And wow. When was the last time you spoke to him? Let's see. Last weekend, I was there on Sunday. So I, oh. I, I'm only an hour away from there, so I generally go every week. Ah, excellent, excellent. So are you yeah. informing him about all the chaos and the news that's been going on, uh, especially? Oh, he's, he's, he's more up on the news than I am. Ah, so. okay. <laughs> So he's you know, he, he stays very well informed. <laughs> I watch news, but he also listens to a lot of BBC news that that uh, provides news from around the world. And he has family members overseas, so he does, you know, get the, the lowdown on what's happening everywhere. So understood. And one of the things okay. I did want to get into here with you was your thoughts and opinions with all the drama unfolding with the. Observatory. Ah, I don't. I haven't followed it too closely, but um, my so I don't know exactly what's happening. But my thought is that they're probably trying to keep us from seeing what's actually happening out there. So there must be something going on around, right. you know, out there that they don't want the public to see. So, <laughs> what right. do you know that I should be commenting on? That's beyond the, that. That's the sunspot solar observatory out in New Mexico, the FBI definitely showed up and shut it down, and they basically concluded an IP address located at the observatory that Uh held, you know, questionable material. Oh. Yeah, but who really knows? It's very strange that that this sort of thing happened, and of course, if you know a thing or two about computers, you are able to manipulate 
certain IP addresses and uh, sort of you're able to do a lot. In other words, you're, you're able to spoof an IP is more the proper term. And perhaps that's something that, that might have well happened. Who really knows? But I, I, I think all of this is a little bit strange to say the least. <laughs> Are they saying like there was a breach of security or they're saying that a weird IP address showed up on the facility or? No, there was, again, there was some sort of child, uh, you know, some adult material there. Ah, uh, oh, interesting. Yeah, yes. I hadn't heard that. Oh, yes. Oh. So that's what, that's what got the FBI's attention. Oh, interesting. Well, and, but again, you know, it's kind of like my husband's case. They can throw as much circumstantial evidence out there as, as they want to, you know, like distract somebody from the truth. So I don't know that right. that didn't happen because I, I don't know and I hadn't even heard that. But, um, you know, I and and if Mark knows, I mean, he usually knows, a lot, you know, a lot of what's going on. But if he knows, he's not telling me. And and I basically we kind of just agree that there's probably something going on out in space that they don't want the public seeing. And I agree. Usually when you get government officials saying certain things, like, uh, for instance, Trump talking about a secret, not a secret, but a, a space force, rather. Oh, that he wants to develop. It, right. Yeah, it makes you think, well, what does he know that we don't exactly? Well, I'm sure that he knows that we already have a space force. In, Correct. <laughs> in, in place. So, you know, there's already hundred, you know, thousands of people involved with it. So. Um, I think you know so when they when they bring up stuff like that, it's often because they now need to admit that we have you know there's a need for it, and that oh, and because they already have these things in place, well now we need to make it public so that we can you know the public can know that we're going to use them. So you know, I, it's it was no shock to me, no surprise to me because you know a lot of us in this industry have been talking about the secret space program stuff for years now, so. It's like the president's kind of behind the times. <laughs> right. That that is a topic that I did want to get into with you as well. Yeah. And okay. Yes. When when you were talking to Mark and he was discussing all these things, the secret space program and uh, Dose, uh, all these topics. What exactly ran through your mind initially? Did you think, oh my God, this man is crazy? <laughs> No, I've never really thought that. And it's interesting because he's been, he's gone about it very methodically because number one, he didn't like dump all of this on me at, at one time. It was like he gave me a couple of reports because at the time I had a small publishing company. So, you know, here's some stuff you could sell at your store. Okay. And I didn't always read it. I mean, I didn't read, he, I had the Dulce report for quite a while before I ever read it and I was selling it before I actually read it myself. And and then um, the report I have about a space mission called the Battle of Vesta, I did have to read it because I needed to type it up. He sent it to me handwritten, so I typed it up and went, oh, wow, this is interesting. And he's been out in space, and he knew these astronauts, and, you know, he met some cool cat things, and this is really cool. And then, oh, my gosh, he's in this battle, and he almost gets killed, and this is awful. And, you know, so this is how often he introduces me to new topics or new subjects or tells me about people he knows and things by giving me the next report. And and a lot of times I would do research. You know, he would have me and other people research, like, biographies of people involved in the missions or um, information about the places, like, here on Earth involved, and sometimes the space, the things out in space. And then, like... Um, I was going to say, just background information on people involved and things. Because, see, he remembers exactly what happened. He doesn't always remember exact dates. He's really good at dates, but he doesn't always remember little specific dates or, you know, little nitty-gritty things that aren't, you know, it's not going to, you know, lose his credibility on any issue. But he just likes to fill in these reports with as much history and science and biographical material as he can. So... Now, now, years and years later, 
I'm reading reports that he's writing. It's like, oh, that's part of the research I sent you way back then. Oh, that, that sounds familiar. And so it's worked out very well for us, for him to, like, give it to me piecemeal and give it to me slowly over time. And 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 now we we have time to, like, you know, we'll sit around. And he goes, okay, now what do you need to know for your next talk? Or oh. what do we need to really go over? Okay. And, you know, so we, we do have time to discuss, you know, things more in depth, you know, now that I'm pretty up on a lot of it. So. Right. And I, I hope this is not too, uh, too personal, but many no. people have asked me to ask you this question. <laughs> uh, some, yeah, some people want to know what motivated you to marry a man in prison. Well, I'll tell you. Um, Go ahead. Because I had a, a, a track record of having loser husbands. So I had been married and divorced several times before I met Mark, and and I wasn't desperate. I didn't, you know, I was dating somebody else when I met him, but here I meet this man. He's like uber smart, and I just I loved that. And he's, you know, he it's not like he's charming like a con man because he's not that at all. But he's very charming and easy to talk to, and his his presence. I just love the military officer presence that he brings to the table every time. But he's also funny, and we just have fun talking about our kids and now our grandkids and, you know. Um, so he's a lot of fun to be with, and we just talk and talk and talk, and I mean, it was just easy. I mean, it, it wasn't like I fell in love the first minute I met him, but right, we've right. always just gotten along very easily, and um, it didn't take me long to figure out that this was a man worth – worth you know visiting in prison and um if i'd been 20 i probably would have said no (laughs) but i'd already and he and and he'd had such a full life before the whole prison thing you know this is a man who who knows how to run a business who is well read he's well educated he um has he's very ethical and you know he's got all these great qualities that i really admire in a person and it's just worked out well for us. So. Understood. And yeah. yes, when you put it in terms that way, I could understand where you're coming from. And I'm glad right. we're having this discussion. I'm not quite sure if you've been able to talk about this so openly yet. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I maybe. Yes, I do. Do People ask me that all the time. And again, it's not like I was 20 when we met. So. You know, I was already past the age of, you know, wanting to have kids or wanting to have more kids. And I was getting, you know, it's like I was in my early 40s, so I didn't really want to be having more kids anyway. So that was never an issue. It's like I didn't miss not having kids. and I mean, I miss not having kids with him. I wish we'd met younger and that would have been possible. But um, but it's not like I gave up a whole big part of my life, you know, and now I'm chained to this person in prison type of thing. So Yeah, that's yeah. good, though. Uh, again, I hope that wasn't too personal to discuss no. on air. <laughs> no, not at okay, all. Okay, <laughs> good, good, good. Because I think it's it's amazing, really. I, I never really talked to anyone who's gone married with anyone that's yeah. in prison. Yeah. So this is amazing. And, and, and again, I wouldn't recommend this to a 20-year-old. Right. Unless maybe she knew the guy beforehand. But then I would still say, are you really sure? Especially if he has a long sentence. You know, are you really sure this is what you want to do? But, again, he and I just have this great rapport and this great trust, and we really get along well. And we've been writing to each other for 21 years now, so we know each other really well. And we have talked pretty much more than most married couples ever do. So, Well, that's, you know, we you ha- know yeah. you're not wrong about that. Lots of people married today, yeah. uh, they are just miserable for the most part. And I, I hate to say this, but lots, of, lots of men I know out there who are married – they're, yeah. they're very angry. And yeah. It, it, you know, it, it comes from, well, you know, comes from yeah. that relationship and how things go. Uh, right. so, sometimes people just do not get along over time. And then there's yeah. the separate bedrooms. And, and you know where that goes. I do. <laughs> oh, yeah. Been there, done that. <laughs> oh, yes. And that's what ends up happening, especially in today's society, which is very strange. And I, uh-huh. I, I want to talk to you about society as well. Sure. Sure. It, it's it's incredible, really, what's going on around us. We did have this sort of paradigm shift the last five, ten years, I would say, uh-huh. where men are a lot different than they used to be. Women are just completely different than what they used to be. 
So <laughs> what works for you will not work for everyone. But the Correct. fact the fact that you found something that does make sense for you and does right. work out for you, I would have to say you are far ahead than lots of people who are married. Well, thank you. I'd like to think so. So. Oh, yes. You never know what's going on behind closed doors in plenty of marriages. Right. You see the neighbor smiling, but you, you really don't know what's going on inside. I know. You're right. Oh, yeah. And, and, and again, you know, I've, I've, I've been there. I've been married several times, and you try to make things look hunky-dory, and, you know, then you're fighting all the time. So. Mm-hmm. Terrible, yeah. terrible, terrible. But, Joanne, I am now very curious. Um, early on in life, did you ever have any sort of experience with, say, the paranormal or strange lights in the sky, anything of that nature? I never did, but um, I have had experiences with paranormal. But again, most of that didn't happen till after I met Mark. Oh, and Mark. yeah, and it's it's interesting because a lot of things have changed for me. And again, and I openly talk about this too. It's like I was an active Mormon for years until I met Mark. And saw that, not that I hate anything about the church, it's just like, oh, I don't need that. Because he and I started talking about just spirituality in general and, and different things, and he opened my eyes up to different, you know, paths. And it's like, oh, oh, well, this stuff is cool. Oh, this stuff is cool. Yeah, this is cool. And all of a sudden, I just didn't feel the need to go to church. Right. But that's, okay. that's kind of another story. But it's okay. Happened, it's okay. Go ahead. You could you could talk about that sort of thing. The the fact yeah. that you got away from the children of the lie. It, well, and it's funny because I've met several. You know, it's like one of the conferences I was at recently. I met several ex Mormon women, and we just started calling us, you know, that we're all recovering Mormons. And again, I, there's nothing that happened to me in the church that was so terrible and horrible that I needed to leave. I just didn't have the need for it anymore. And, you know, church is like a half a day on Sunday, and I wanted to go see Mark. <laughs> so uh, going to yes. church put a damper in my visiting. So it's like, oh, well, I'm going to go to see him. Forget church. So understood. So when you were first coming up as an adolescent back at back at home with mom and dad, did they right. raise you in a religious household? Um, we we were Methodist, but again, they you know, I don't ever remember us going to church much as a family when I was little. You know, they drop us off at Sunday school, and then I met some friends who we became friends with a family who was Mormon. So I just started going to the Mormon church when I was 10. But again, if my family went off camping, you know, I didn't stay home just to go to church. But, you know, I was a very active Mormon, you know, like for 30 years. Understood. Understood. So, wow. You really but did my, put in my the time. parents were not, my family's not. Um, so no, I would not say our family was very religious. Understood. And did mom and dad ever have any unusual experiences of their own? Not that they ever shared. They they were not sharing type people about anything. So we we knew very little about their upbringing or their parents. I mean, I I knew my dad's parents better than I knew my mom. My my mom's dad died when she was young, so I don't I, I never met him. Um, and of course, I knew her mom because she was with us for a long time. But um, but nobody shared anything about weird experiences. Okay. It was enough to get them to just talk about themselves, which wasn't didn't happen very often. Understood, understood. And another question in regards to Mark. Uh, people are curious, when exactly does he get out? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> yeah, they want him he out. Has, he has technically a life without parole sentence. Oh, my but goodness. But there are, there are things happening in... The, in California, that number one, a lot of the lifers are applying for a commutation of sentence so that they can become eligible for parole. So that's one avenue to pursue. There's also a lot of legislation that's kind of in the works or will be in the works or, you know, I, I guess it's already in the works or I wouldn't have heard about it, that like if you're old, meaning 65 or older, and he is, um, you might you know, you might have been in there long enough to get out. You know, right. they might just put an age limit on some of that. Yeah. And and also your health, if you're sick, and he has health problems. I mean, he's not dying. Um, 
I know it's funny because Carrie Cassidy told somebody that he's in failing health. And I'm thinking, Carrie, he's not, he's not dying. He just, you know, we're older and, and he yeah. has health issues. And it's, and a lot of it's from being in space and things or in, uh, you know, in submarines and, and space vessel or whatever you want to call them, spacecraft. And so it, it's funny because the doctors don't recognize why he has things, but um, certain things are because of all his years in space and stuff. But anyway, so there are things that give give us a little hope. And if I knew the, the numbers of the bills, I would tell people to write their California people and tell them to, you know, approve it. But so who knows? Because the, the prisons here are so overcrowded that they have to do something. And it's it's costing the state oh a ton of money. We used to say it cost the state like eighty thousand dollars if the guy had a lot of health problems. Well, that was twenty years ago. Now it probably costs the state like a hundred grand a year a year if the guy's got health problems. So you, you don't know. And there's a lot of guys, and there's a lot of guys that are older than Mark, and I see them every now and then. I'm going, oh my gosh. That guy looks too, too old to be a prison. Oh, yeah. You know, what is that 80-year-old walking around on a walker going to do? Toddle into a bank and rob it? I don't know. Anyway. Yeah, so th there's a lot of things going on here in our home state of California. Uh -huh. So who really knows what's going to happen? We kind of have to wait and see. And the right. prison issue is one, just one big conundrum. Yeah. So, I mean, I always come from the place that... I have never given up hope. I have never known how he will get out. I just know that someday, hopefully before we're 80, hopefully before we're 70, you know, I'm, I'm lowering the bar, um, that he will be home. He's got grandkids he's never met in person, and, you know, we have things to do. We have work to do together in this whole industry and, and whatever that needs to be done with him out of prison. <laughs> And There's only so much I really, you can do I really, with him there and me here. <laughs> correct, and I really do hope he does get out and you guys get the chance to uh, finally be together. Yeah, me too. Yeah, yeah. That, that would he, be he, he wants to come home and fix up the house and, you know. Right. And that's fine by me. <laughs> oh, of course, of course. Now, in terms of disclosure, the, right. the media went nuts for a while there, if if you recall. I do. Oh yes. There's what that, what does Mark? Whole, um, uh huh. What does Mark think about that? You know he he looks at uh, you know I don't know exactly how to describe how he thinks about that because he looks at everything people bring up and because he knows that there's government people that purposely put out disinformation and he knows there's people who you know are allowed to say certain things. Um, I only am allowed to say what we're allowed to say. He doesn't tell me anything that I'm not supposed to share. So, so that's good. Um, he's not always, he's very careful and he, he does track or follow what people out on the speaking uh, circuit are saying. And we will talk about, you know, well, is this guy on track and is this, you know, oh, are good, they telling good. the See, truth that's, or whatever? That's so, what, but, that's what I'm leading up to. Is, right. is that the whole talk, uh, circuit, the conferences, I definitely want to know his opinion and of course your opinion since, you know, you, you go, you go to these things and you give lectures, you see the people that I go do. there. And I always wonder which one of these people, which one of these individuals are telling the truth and which ones are more or less embellishing their stories. That runs through my head every time I'm at a conference. I, I have to be honest here. Yeah, and, and what I tell people, because I'm not going to, especially in an interview like this, <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm not going to share. It's like I'm not going to disrespect anybody out I'm there. Not, I'm not speaking. I don't want you to. No, no names have to be involved. Yeah, yeah. It's okay. Um, um, but so we do talk sometimes about. Well, you know, he he thinks maybe well that guy might be being fed wrong information or inaccurate information. Like some of it might be true, but some of it might not be quite true. And but what I say to people, and, and we we think that about some different people, and and some people, you know, and it's not just him and I. It's like other people that I talk to. It's like, okay, well, you know, um, we just we just wonder about people, and sometimes you can kind of get a better sense for who might, um, I don't know, who you, who you might need to look twice at. Right. But what I but what I tell people is that you know you have to learn how to discern 
for yourself. Oof. You have to listen to what they're saying, Joanne. you know, do your research, and, and how do you feel about it? Joanne, you know, Joanne, I'm... that's that's one <laughs> thing I tell everyone out there who goes headfirst into all these things. How do you discern from fact from fiction? That's something that always goes through my mind when I talk to lots of individuals out there. Because right. many of them seem to have blind spots in their logic. Right, right. Let's just be realistic. So that, that could be a red flag. I mean, if they're, if it doesn't seem, if the dots don't line up, that could be a problem. Um, I, you know, I, I have a little spidey sense. So if my weird <laughs> radar, if my yes. spidey sense goes off, there's usually a problem. <laughs> right, right. You know. Oh, I'm with but, you. And again, sometimes you just, you have to do the research. If you, if the person is like saying this, then you need to go study it out and listen to what other people have said. And one of my friends, she's, she's really good because she likes to believe everybody at, you know, at first, but she will also check them out in the background. And it's like, well, and her, her philosophy is like, you know, I want to hear three people that have said, you know, validating things regarding maybe not regarding what that person said but like similar to what you know maybe i've i've been saying you know she wants to hear three people say stuff that would validate what i say and i think she's that way with most speakers or every speaker or you know researchers or whistleblowers whatever you want to say um so it, you shouldn't just take my word for it but i mean i know i'm telling the truth but you shouldn't just take my word for it like try and do some research on your own because sometimes especially a lot of times Mark can write a certain amount of information, but then he, he can only bring us to a certain point. He can't tell everybody everything he knows about a topic, perhaps. And sometimes he just wants to, to give you enough clues so that then you need to carry on the research because, you know, okay, I've, I've told you as much as I can, but you need to keep asking questions and keep searching for the, the other answers and um you know, that's a good teacher anyway, but, but that's sometimes he, he can only give us so many hints. Yeah. And then he, he's on the edge of what he can't say. <laughs> yeah, well, that makes sense. I understand. Yeah. There's certain yeah. things that you can't really speak of. Right, right. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because I remember the first time I went to England, I had a huge list from him of places that I, really had to go visit and you know these are great places and if you have the time and if you don't it's like it was like a list of prioritized places he really wanted me to go see and a lot of them were places where um he had been as a child and as an adult doing because they lived there in england for a couple of years and doing different things or he would have told me like okay this is where we went and had this experience okay this is where we went and had this experience and when i went there you know 30 some odd years later I could feel that that he was telling me the truth. You know, I got you know my little spidey sense was, you know, going woo, woo, you know, in a good way. You know, it goes <laughs> yes. it, it put, sends me directions either way, but you know, good or bad. So it's like I I could tell he was telling me the truth, and that was so validating for me. I loved that. Um, but sometimes it has nothing to do with him. Sometimes it's just I get a feeling that you know, oh, this is this is on the mark, or this is really true, or it's like, you know, it's like even the paranormal stuff, I can tell if there's a ghost in the room usually, and then my friend who usually is with me can see them. So between the two of us, oh, okay, we know something that the other people in the room don't know. This is cool. <laughs> Fantastic. But, um, and by the way, are, are you ready for Halloween? Well, tonight is a, a autumnal equinox, so I'm ready for that. <laughs> Um, I'm not ready for Halloween yet, but I'm ready for the equinox. That has to come first. It's very important. It's a very witchy, pagan, fairy celebration. That so. it is. I wasn't expecting you to say that. <laughs> I'm like, Joanne, you know about that. <laughs> My goodness. Yeah, that's, that's uh, you know, the <laughs> other woo-woo side of me. <laughs> Understood. And I, I love talking to you, Joanne, because you oh, have always you. been so open and just completely fascinating with any subject <laughs> I throw at you. <laughs> well, it's it's interesting, too, because, again, I got interested in the paranormal because Mark sent me on an errand. He's like, go go hear this psychic. She's talking about ghosts on the Hornet. It's like, okay. And then all of a sudden we're on the Hornet and I'm seeing ghosts. And then I'm seeing ghosts other places, and I'm seeing ghosts other places. And then, you know, he's – and I don't know if you and I talked about elementals or the fairy realm last time we talked, but 
Um, that's a big important part of his culture and his life and his Celtic upbringing or background. And, and again, witchy, paranormal, Celtic, fairy stuff ties very closely into alien stuff because you know, they all seem to know each other. <laughs> it's a very and weird circle how all, all the, all it, these strange things sort of coexist. Yeah, and it's, it's funny because like the, the elementals here on Earth love this planet and protect this planet and, um, but there's elementals and fairy creatures out in space that come with alien species who come here sometimes. So it's like, oh, well that's fascinating. So again, because of Mark, I've learned a ton about the elemental realm and the wonderful creatures in that realm and the beings. And so I take very good, we have, I have several that live here and I take, I try to take good care of them. So that's why, you know, they're, the autumnal equinox is a big, big day for them. So. Amazing. And of yeah. course, I want your opinion on Elon Musk and all of the space, uh, space exploration they plan uh-huh. on doing. Um, would, would you ever take that sort of ride around the moon if, if you were wealthy enough? I mean, that's a lot of money uh, to take I that would. trip. You would do it. I would love to go. Joanne, yeah. you're, you're so, and, you know, you're so a crazy. Japanese billionaire, um, and I should have signed up. It sounds like he's like giving, he's going to be like the first person to do that. And he's like giving away seats to go with him and it's like wow. I should have signed up but yes I would absolutely do that if I was sure that you know the ship well you can never be totally sure but you know if I was pretty confident the ship wasn't just going to blow up but uh, Elon Musk has had good track record with his his testing and stuff so um, you know sure why not <laughs> I, I'm a little I'm, I'm too scared of heights to take that sort of trip my goodness oh. Yeah, I don't mind flying. You don't and, mind. You know, you're okay. going to be going so fast that you're not necessarily going to see anything to like get out there and sit around, you know, in in, in space. So, you know, I'll just shut my eyes until we. <laughs> <laughs> that is amazing. I think it's though. harder to come back. It's harder to come back through the atmosphere than it probably is to like leave the atmosphere. That's my feeling. The the ride back is a bumpy ride. I think so too. Yeah. I, I just don't uh, think. And Mark I could... has confirmed that he's, you know, he's been out he's in been space there. many times, and he's confirmed that um, it's a bumpy ride coming back through that through the atmosphere. <laughs> well, you are very brave because I could not endure that sort of thing. Well, I'd like to think I can. I'm, I'm willing to give it a shot. Excellent, excellent. Oh. <laughs> and of, of course, speaking about disclosure and all that, this uh-huh. brings me back to my conversation. With Stephen Bassett. Oh, uh huh. Yeah, I had a great conversation with him and we were talking, okay. we, we, you know, we brought up politics and we were talking about Hillary and Trump. And one of the things he told me was way back when, uh, Bill actually very much interested in this and wanted to disclose UFOs and extraterrestrials, but he was stonewalled. Allegedly. Sure. Alleg- well, that's allegedly. I'm not sure, but maybe that's a fact. And later on in the conversation, he alludes that if Hillary was elected, she would have have been the disclosure president. I'm not sure if that's true, though. What are your thoughts and opinions? Yeah, she wants to think she would have been. (laughs) That's what I'm saying. Trust me, the military has a very distinct, unless things go wrong and there's no way you can hide something and all of a sudden you have disclosure, you know, the, the government or the military has a very distinct timeline about when they would like to just even set a date for disclosure. And it's a, it's more than, well, we're at 2018. Like 2031 is supposedly when they're going to set a date for disclosure. That's so far away. Yeah. And, and who knows? The date may be 50, 100 years or more af- out of that. So, but you know, we're already having little pockets of disclosure here and there and it's you know all this grassroots stuff that we're all doing is is more important to me than the president standing up and saying oh yeah by the way because they all know the president has to be told to at least a little bit of that when he gets into office so that doesn't mean he doesn't he still doesn't know as much as like the military but um you know they only tell him what he has to know but they he does be told that you know a little bit so at least he knows that it's it's a true thing. <laughs> yes. Um, and by the way, you brought up Carrie Cassidy. How is she doing nowadays? 
She's doing well. She's coming back to see us next weekend. So we have another, she's coming to visit again next weekend. So that will be fun. So as far as that, I haven't heard from her lately. I know she was in England and, and other places. I, I think she did like a, a group thing in Egypt in the oh. spring. And then in the summer in July, she was doing one of her mini conferences um, outside of London. And, you know, we've been emailing back and forth a little bit. So I'm, I'm sure she's fine. Yeah, I'm glad she is. She seems to be very busy nowadays and i'm glad <laughs> going she in there. is and i you know i she gets around so that's great she really does and you brought up egypt and that reminds me i need to get back uh, a hold of zahi hawass who uh zahi hawass oh i don't know who that is oh well he former antiquities uh, uh so, yeah he, he was supposed to be on the program but things fell through, and you know how uh, that goes. Okay. So, yeah, now I have to reconnect. Terrible. Oh, well, I met a, a fascinating man at in, in – what month is this? this is September. So in August, <laughs> mid-August, I was in Colorado for the Dimensions of Disclosure Conference, and I was speaking, and Dr. Sam – I can't pronounce his last name, but he's from Bosnia – and fascinating, very nice guy, fascinating talk mm -hmm. about, you know, pyramids all over the world and then the Bosnian pyramids. And it's like I wish I could have talked to, I mean, listened to his whole talk. But it was a couple hours long and I wanted to get back to my table. But um, fascinating stuff, you know, about pyramids. And yeah, not really is. The history behind them not being what we were told when we were growing up in school. So. <laughs> no doubt. And have you been out there to Egypt? No, never have. Never? I've okay. been to England uh, five times, and I've been to oh, northern Mexico years and years ago, and I think I've been to, you know, like Vancouver, Canada once when I was a little girl. That's about it. Understood, understood. And going <laughs> back to Dulce, New Mexico, is that still operational uh, to this day, or has things changed? You know, that's a good That's a good. There, there must be something still there, but I don't know to what extent. Either that or, cause I know there's, there's beings that are protecting it. So either they just don't want people to find it and, and get in there and, you know, mess about with what's down there, or maybe there's still things going on at a, you know, a lesser level. I don't think it's as active as it used to be. Because Mark didn't have any problem with me going there, and I've gone there twice now, and you know, so and I didn't get any weird ooh stay away you know vibes when I was there. I did not go up on the mesa like some of they took some tour groups up there. I didn't do that, but um, but I didn't feel any like I didn't feel afraid. I didn't feel weird, and it was just it was one of my favorite conferences. And I don't know that they're going to do it again, but um, it was delightful being there. Amazing. And yes, this seems to be very strange, the, the location rather. New Mexico right. and uh, parts of Arizona. They really do seem to be a hotbed for abductions and sightings and the paranormal. Right, right. And it's interesting because even today, now again, part of the reason why I think things must be still happening there is the, the natives that live there, they see UFOs practically every night. You know, there's, there's one gal I talked to and like last year she was telling me, oh yeah, you know, we sit outside our house and we see UFOs flying in and out of the Mesa like every night or flying at least in the area every night. And, um, and I, when I started this year, I go, okay, is that still happening? Yep. <laughs> it's like, and there's a lot of Bigfoot evidence because there's a lot of Bigfoot creatures there. And um trying to think, I, and I'm sure that the native, you know, I don't, they don't they don't talk as much about like ghost things, but that doesn't mean that doesn't happen. But you know, there's there's certain things that they don't necessarily want to talk about. Yeah. Um, but it's just it's a wonderful community, and I just I love the people there. So it's interesting that you brought up Bigfoot because I think on the second half of the program with my guest John Olson, I think uh -huh. we're going to talk a little bit about Bigfoot. Yeah, it's it's fabulous. I I never, I never again. I never thought about much of any of this stuff until I met Mark. And in a couple of his reports, like when he went to when when he was in England as a kid, the conference that his dad was involved with, 
there were some Bigfoots that came like as bodyguards because they hire themselves out to various species. So, um, so they, they came with a, another species kind of like as a bodyguard. And then oh, another wow. time he was in Bolivia and some came, it came in with a, another species, another a female of another species, you know, came along with her. And they were very nice. So he's, his, his encounters have been very positive. And then I remember there's one report. Let's see about the night. There was a conference in Iran in 1971, and some things were going on. And so he's relate in his report. He's relating a conversation at some base. I think it was on Mars, um, but don't quote me. But I think that's where it was. But um, I guess it was Ashtar or Saint Germain. For I think it's Ashtar. Uh, it was having a conversation with two two Sasquatch, and they're talking. It's like, oh yes, we know Mark, and it's like blah blah blah. And it's like. <laughs> It's, like, it's pretty funny reading about a conversation that somebody's having in space about your husband. You know? Oh, my goodness. And they, they know him by reputation or they've worked with him, and it's like it's, it's pretty funny who he knows. Right. <laughs> human and not human. <laughs> there was an individual by the name of Robert David Steele. He uh-huh. made a statement about Mars and sex trafficking children and such out there, and it caused all sorts of international headlines and nasa even had to step in and get very angry wow right and he's been on this program i'm not exactly Uh quite sure where he got that information from but is this sort of thing going on out there well it does go on i don't know that it goes on on mars i I don't know mark cannot talk about mars because probably that was his u.s military stuff when he had anything but he knows he, I know he knows a lot about Mars. He just can't talk about it. Um, now, I also know that there are species who kidnap humans and take them out into space. I always just assumed they took them out much farther, you know, to other species. They just sell them off for nasty things. And um, but who knows if they don't drop some off at Mars? I don't. I just I don't have that information. But understood. I do know that humans are kidnapped and they are sold out in space to species who want to do horrible things to them. My God, I hope that's not true. But someone in the chat room did. It is. Oh my God. Someone in the chat room did want me to ask you about Antarctica and your thoughts <laughs> and opinions. So go ahead and weigh in on that. Okay. And thanks for the question. Um, so I don't know a ton about the Antarctic. I do know that Mark's dad was there in the 40s after the war with Admiral Byrd under what's, you know, known as Operation High Jump. And I know there was some they, – they were trying to, you know, deal with Nazi stuff, but there was also some UF, UFO activity that they were dealing with, and I do have a report about that. Um, let's see. And I know that – the well, the Falklands wasn't at Antarctic. That was closer to Argentina, so we won't – say that but um that's another story very interesting all of this there is and i don't know exactly what's in the antarctic i know that the nazis have a base there they still have a base there there's a huge portal there so that's that's pretty cool i know different aliens have come and gone from there i know that um you know there's there's a lot of talk about you know why are so and so why are government age you know uh, people or politicians going down there and what mark has said now is that it's a great private place to have meetings because you're not going to have a lot of press people there, you know. (laughs) So it's a great place for humans and non-humans to have meetings, so I'm sure a lot of that goes on. And also when we, when our space fleet um, maybe wasn't active in a mission or something, they would often park over the Antarctic and I know early on he was saying, well, that's why there's such a huge hole in the ozone there because, you know, you had these spacecraft of ours that, you know, were run with nuclear bombs, so they caused a hole in the ozone. But um, but it's, it's funny, too, when we bring up the secret space program is right. that's what everybody calls it now. And, and, but, like, back when Mark was telling me about this being out in space, at least the one – program that he told me about and now I'm I'm understanding there's more than one but was called the deep space fleet and you know that's how he called it for years so um the deep the secret space program was kind of a new term for me but now I use it yeah it's this is something that's been around for a while and right uh, 
there's been all sorts of various presidents in our history who also very much involved and interested in the subject. Jimmy Carter, oh, yeah. Jimmy Carter's one that always gets brought up. Right. He saw, he had a sighting. Uh, President Kennedy was totally in the know. And in fact, he is, he and the British Prime Minister authorized the conference in June of 1961 that Mark was at as a little boy. His dad helped organize it and ran the security for it. So President Kennedy, you know, authorized it, but he couldn't be there or he, you know, I don't, you know, he was also dealing with stuff coming up in Cuba and all that, but, um, so I don't know if he, he had other things he had to do, but I mean, Vice President Johnson was there, but for whatever reason, President Kennedy was not at that conference, but the British Prime Minister was. Very interesting. Yeah. It, it makes you really wonder what's really going on behind closed doors, especially right. with, especially within government. And right. those with these really, really secretive clearances. And I know what I was going to tell you when you brought up Hillary. You know, and I, it's, again, um, at one point, I don't remember when exactly, you know, Mark was saying, like, when a, a president is inaugurated, and, and this may not be, you know, verbatim, but it's like, he goes, you know, they'll take you aside and they'll tell you some of the things you probably don't know yet, you know, like aliens are real type of stuff. And, okay, cool. But, you know, they're... It's like if Hillary had just taken it upon herself to decide to do disclosure without the full buy-in of the military and all that, she probably would have been killed. It's like this is why sometimes presidents get killed and sometimes uh, shahs are deposed or kicked out of their country because they want to start talking. And, you know, there are agendas and timelines for when you're allowed to talk and when you're not. So very people true. are silenced one way or the other if they talk before they're supposed to. And what exactly is your opinion on the individual Paul Hillier? That's the guy from Canada? Right. Um, I, I, I don't know much about him. I, I, I think, if I'm thinking correctly, he is one that has said this is all true and real, right? Mm -hmm. He yeah, is another yeah. so, individual. Who, yeah, that's cool. Right. He's not in office anymore either. No, <laughs> exactly. And I don't, Former. I don't think he said that while he was in office. Oh, I don't think he could have. Yeah, no. I, and again, a lot of these, a lot of these, like for, and I'll, I'll, I keep going back to the England conference. A lot of, there were a lot of heads of state there, royalty or just, you know, presidents of countries, things like that. They all saw, they were all having meetings with aliens. Whether they believed in aliens before they ever got there or not, they all knew they existed by the end of the conference. They all had to go home and pretend nothing had happened. They couldn't go home and start talking about alien this and alien that. But I mean, they were making deals. They were, they crafted a treaty. And they all had to go home and pretend nothing had happened. Yeah. And that's so. how I sort of feel about the whole issue with the Sunspot Solar Observatory out in New Mexico. Right. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure there's uh -huh. something happening. Something that, happened. Uh, yeah. We can't know about. <laughs> very, and, and again, very you know, another example of this, for example, um, there's a couple of reports that Mark sent me early on. So 1976, there was an invasion fleet coming over China. There was a reptilian group working with the Nazis in the Antarctic, and it was all kind of part of the same thing. They were supposed to set off earthquakes so ki or people could get kidnapped. You had invasion fleets who were going to come in and, you know, start taking over and things. So, and this is happening, like, while the rest of the world doesn't even know anything's happening. You know, the Chinese certainly knew about it because they had a big earthquake and they saw lights in the sky. But this was before the days of everybody had a cell phone with a camera and CNN could not be there the minute something happened. And, mm -hmm. and there was, and I'm, I think that was the year, yeah, that was probably the year of like, I tell people, it's like, I was in a church dance festival probably when they were up in space, our military was up in space dealing with an alien invasion fleet or the following year, you know, I was pregnant. No, I just had a baby. I had like a baby a couple months before that when another invasion fleet was coming and destroyed our base on the moon. It's like, so we didn't have any clue. And the government was not going to come on the news and say, oh, by the way, the Earth lived another day because our military was out in space dealing with bad aliens. Exactly. That's <laughs> not something they would disclose publicly at all. Yeah, no. So Not at all. It's like. Just to, just to imagine, and, and, and I know people poo-poo the military a lot. It's like what I have learned by being married to this man and reading all his stuff is like I have so much of a greater respect 
for the military and especially what they're, you know, they've been dealing with this stuff for, for years and years, but like especially what's going on now in the Middle East and whatever. I mean, these poor kids are seeing things that they should never have to see. And, you know, it's like, and we still have no clue. We wonder why their PTSD is so bad. And that's part of the reason. Yeah, there's lots of strange things that go on uh, within the military and all sorts yeah. of different branches, really. And, again, it, it takes so long before we even get any sort of real truth. Just look at NASA. All, right. all, all the years they've been involved, they've dealt with all sorts of manipulation of photos and video. Well, and, and NASA was – is the public, I mean, and yes, NASA went to space, NASA was doing its thing, but NASA was also like the public cover story for what the military was doing in space. So while, uh-huh. you know, their, their budget, they, you, they wanted you to think they were spending, and they were, obviously they had spent a lot of money, but some of that money, a lot of that money that we thought was the NASA budget was to cover up some of the stuff the military was using in space or building for space or whatever, because, you know, we had cool stuff out there. (laughs) Very cool stuff, and I've always heard that JPL owns the moon. I have no idea. I mean, I can't imagine how any one organization can own the moon when several species have bases there. Right. And and I I can't mm -hmm. imagine that the German government or the Russian government would allow a United States corporation to own the moon. (laughs) My goodness, yes. Lots of different things are talked about in regards to the moon and what goes Uh on there. You have people like John Lear who talks about these giant crystals, uh, structures on the moon, if I, if I recall correctly. Right. Yeah. So much goes on there. And I'm curious, do you believe we went to the moon in 69? Yes, we absolutely did. No problem. We, we went there and we came back. Just as broadcasted. We've been there many times. Yes, and it's not to say that uh, some of the pictures that we saw either were filmed early or might have been filmed to represent what happened there because there were alien craft sitting on the hill watching our landing. You know, so we couldn't show those pictures. I see. But but we definitely went to the moon. My husband's been to the moon. He says it's beautiful looking back at Earth. But, yes, we have and, – and actually, you know, and we've been going to the moon and in space since the 40s. So when he met aliens in 1961 at that conference, they were telling him, even the children aliens, and he was it's like, you know, we've, we've know you've been – this was 1961. We know you guys have been out in space for years. And it's like, okay, we, we hadn't – done a moon landing publicly in 1961, um, but the aliens knew we had been out in space for years by then. <laughs> and how many species of aliens are there? I'm very curious. If you hundreds, know. hundreds. Hundreds. Because there were at least a hundred that came to the England conference, and there were at least twice that many that went to the conference 10 years later in Iran because more and more species had heard about these conferences, so they wanted to come. So, and, and that, you know, who knows how many there are exactly. He hasn't, he's never given me a, an exact number, but again, the military knows a lot more about them than they're going to fully tell us. But, and also the military knows where, where a lot of them are that they're not going to tell us. And because they don't want us they, the aliens don't necessarily want us knowing exactly where they live and horning, you know, they don't want us attacking them or, you know, deciding we need to be in charge or, or whatever. Um, and what, what else was I going to say? You know, and they have, they have business operations out there. They don't, they don't want us horning in on their stuff. So, and it's like, cause I think, oh, a couple of years ago or whatever, there was a new planet or a new, something that we discovered with one of our new better telescopes or whatever. Oh, and another um, Earth. Tapist or Trippist or starts with a T, um, Trappist. I don't know. We, we have just seen something that everybody decided that could be like habitable or whatever. It starts with a T, I think, and I thought sounds like Tippist or Trappist or something. I apologize if I'm screwing up the name. But, you know, these, these beings that live on these planets or whatever, it's like they don't necessarily want us to know exactly where they live. So they're not necessarily happy with some of the technology we might be coming up with. 
And in terms of classic UFO cases and the things of the past, have there ever been any cases you thought were just completely credible? Ooh. Well, I, I probably have not given that a lot of thought. I do like to read. I love reading, um, what was I going to say? I've read a lot of Richard Dolan's Nas- the National Security or whatever it's called, UFOs in the National Security State, from a lot of his early research using, you know, Freedom of Information Act to get documents and stuff. So he cited several sightings and incidents, you know, and I have no trouble with those, especially since several of them are ones that my husband or his dad were involved with. I love Preston Dennett's books about, you know, sightings over Topanga Canyon, sightings over here and there and stuff, because he just goes and interviews all these people, and so there's a lot of great stories out there. And, and again, I don't really spend the time to worry about, you know, if if that person's telling the truth or not, because I have my own stuff I'm working on. Understood. So, yeah. I always and just, I'm happy mm-hmm. to listen to everybody's story at least once. Of course. I always just like to ask, other people out there, their opinions on just these fantastic stories of the past, since today we don't really get too many um, great iconic stories. Yeah, no, and and again, and and it's funny because, again, like I haven't, I wasn't doing all this research or that interested in this stuff before I met Mark, so I remember in the early days, you know, people would go, oh, have you heard what this guy said? Have you read that? Or did I go, you know, no. (laughs) It's like, I wasn't interested in this stuff at all, and I haven't, like, you know, that was like my first or second conference. Like, I don't know what anybody's talking about unless I've just heard them speak. And, and again, most of the time if I'm at a conference, I'm, man, I'm staffing my table, so I don't get the opportunity always to hear what everybody else is saying. Yeah, um, definitely. And but, it I is... mean, like, I was, I was at a business meeting mm-hmm. just the other day, and, you know, we're sitting at a Pete's Coffee and we're talking about UFOs because I'm, I'm working on a couple little, you know, short films, the ideas and stuff. And and um, this woman behind us uh, so at the table next to me, she was, oh, you guys talking about UFOs? And I go, yeah. <laughs> and she's going, oh, you know, my brother um, saw something. And she started to, you know, talk. And, but, you know, he's, he's, you know, he would never talk about it or whatever. I go, well, here's my card. If he wants to talk about it, you know, I'm happy to listen. And, and we've got a local group if he ever wants to talk about it. But, um, you know, it seems like, he, like whatever job it is he does, they, it would have never been appropriate for him to talk to those people about it. So, but it was funny because sometimes, you know, you're just around people and they'll bring up their story. So. Oh, of course. And you hear so yeah, many. Of, yeah. You hear so many of these great stories. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Even in passing, and many people are really just so afraid to actually share them, right? Due to right. ridicule, you know how that goes. I do. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I, I belong to a business networking group for my bookkeeping business, and most everybody in there knows. At least once they get to know me, they know my husband's in prison, and they know I'm all into UFO stuff. Now, a lot of them think it's perfectly fine. You know, like they're sympathetic about the prison thing. Um, and we haven't really discussed, you know, I don't discuss his case when I'm in my networking mode, but, um, you know, we, we, we get together privately to get to know each other better. You know, it's a whole networking thing anyway. Um, but several of them are thoroughly fascinated with the UFO stuff. Now there are others who don't want me ever to mention it when I'm talking to them and, you know, they don't believe in it. And it's like, you know, so I know who not to talk to about it. But it's funny because most of my clients, a lot of them know this is what I do <laughs> and think it's wonderful. And, you know, it's like, sorry, I'm not going to be at work next week. I have a conference. But, <laughs> you know. Oh, yes, so, so, definitely. Yeah, some of them have come to hear me speak. And, you know, some are interested in the interviews I've done and, you know, this and that. So it's, have, it's have, interesting. And, yeah, and the and, ones that don't want to mm-hmm. know, don't. I don't tell them. Don't but ask. it's funny because I go to one client <laughs> And then she has a, she has coaching clients and sometimes when they're at her house for a session, she'll, in, let me introduce you to my bookkeeper and guess what else she does? <laughs> oh my. She's more interested in telling them that I'm a UFO speaker than anything else, so it's pretty well, funny. It is very interesting Maybe. because lots of people are not of that nature or even have that sort of uh, mindset at all. Right. Right. So, right. yeah, it is very well, interesting. And, and my daughter, bless her heart, she doesn't necessarily believe in the UFO alien part of it, but she's very supportive 
of my activity in it because she knows I'm very passionate about it. So, I mean, we will brainstorm on, you know, like how to get me out there more and different ways for people to connect with me more or for me to get my information. So, like, on the business side of that and the marketing side, she we will brainstorm about that. She's heard me speak once. I was giving a, a lecture in her area, and, you know, but she sat in the back of the room, and she didn't necessarily listen to the whole thing, but but she heard enough of it to know, oh, Mommy did a good job. You know, not that, oh, I believe everywhere you said, but Mommy did a good job. So, you know, that's cool. If I if I can present well, you know, that's good. But it, it's just funny. She's very supportive, and I love that, oh, I'm whether happy. she believes me or not. <laughs> I'm glad that you do have that support because most yeah, people, yeah, most people out there, their loved ones or friends, they don't even care no. what, what you're into. Right. <laughs> that's just the reality of it. Um, if yeah. you ask your best friend something and, you know, they tell you what they're really into, more or less you kind of don't really care. Yeah, as yeah. As sad as that well, may be. It's like my, um, my family, my extended family, uh, let's see, my sister is like daughter-in-law. She's, she's very interested in this stuff and she's very interested in Bigfoot. And she's got a fabulous Bigfoot tattoo on her arm. And, um, and oh, then wow. one of my, my great nephews, he's very interested in, we, we talk about space a little bit, but he's also very interested in the, the elemental realm and stuff like that. So we can walk around his – we've walked around his property one time. He goes, can you, you know, walk with me and show me where you think some of the fairies are? And I was like, sure. And we had a fabulous experience doing that. Amazing. So. And, Joanne, I'm very curious. Has there been anyone that you know or other people around you that have become hostile towards any of these <laughs> things you've talked about? Sorry. It's okay. Um, you could laugh. Host- hostile? <sighs> there are um, a lot of times when I'm doing an interview, and I, I rarely watch the chat rooms, um, but sometimes, as, as we call them, uh, there are, are trolls on there, <laughs> yes. and sometimes the comments are nasty. Or, oh, yes. or there's people who spend a lot of energy on their websites trying to debunk us or you know, they've tried to say, well, we can't find any information out there to back her stuff up. Or it's like, we can't find her husband's military records. Or so they think we're full of hot air. And it's like, dude, he did top secret stuff. You're not supposed to find his military records. Right. You're not supposed to find pictures of him everywhere. It's top secret. <laughs> there are reasons. Um, I have, I had, I've had a couple of interestingly um, negative journalists interview me in the last year oh, and no. one of them he it was it's interesting because he came across like you know we want to do a story about you and your husband and blah 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 and, you know everybody we always talk about how we met and this and that and we talk about the secret space program and, and that kind of stuff and and he spent he must have called me like four or five times and we would spend an hour or more every time and he was doing a very what I thought was probably a lengthy story, but um and it wasn't that he was hostile, but the information he presented about my husband's case was like totally just the DA side of the story. It you know, he wasn't getting my side you know, our side of, you know, what probably happened. And and the whole this whole title of the, the thing was like she's married to a murderer or whatever. Oh, okay. And you know, it's like you know, so and they used cartoon pictures of us it's like i sent you some really nice pictures what's <laughs> oh wow like, so he did de- happy <laughs> he, he definitely had a different motive then they did and That's you know I, I have to be very careful of the press especially if they're not the standard uh radio shows that do ufo talks you know regularly like most of you guys Understood. these have been like more mainstream press people and then there was a, another lady who, well, I'm so-and-so from the Daily Mail, New York office. I go, the Daily Mail is a trash newspaper in the U.K. Oh, well, I'm in the New York office. So I'm going, and so the difference is. You know, <laughs> I know, right? But, you know, we want to do an article about how you and your husband met and what it's like to be married to somebody in prison. I was like, great. We talked for a half an hour, and then she brought up something that triggered t- to me that, I knew she wanted to talk about his case, and I said, I'm not talking about his case right now. We're working on a legal remedy, so we're right. not talking about the case. And, oh, and then, well, can I interview this person? I go, no. Can I interview this person? No. Um, oh, we'll just use what we have. Then I go, well, then let me well, let me see what his lawyers say about that. Okay, we've decided not to do the story. It's like, good answer. 
<laughs> have you noticed that, that lots of people today in society are just so angry and nasty? Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't really talk to them too much. You know, but most people, if they're that angry, they haven't come up to me and they're not spewing hostility in my face. If I know they're around me for a less credible reason, I get my little sense and I need to leave, and I do. So, you know, if they're following me around for some reason or if they're checking on me, you know, they're not necessarily approaching me, especially not in a hostile manner. So I don't have to talk to them, but I know I need to get out of there. Very good, Uh, yes. I'm glad you're picking up on those sort of things because I know those people are out there and they are parasites. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. My (laughs) goodness. And, Joanne, after all of these... After all of all of the knowledge you've soaked up, rather, I'm still curious. In terms of watching movies about the subject, uh huh. Where exactly do you lie with that? Do you also believe, like myself, that's under the notion that Hollywood has just completely lost all originality, and they get well, all these things wrong? Well, here, well, I I don't watch every UFO or science. I don't watch a lot of science fiction. I, I love the movie Abyss. I love the movie Arrival. I loved um, Jodie Foster's, was it called First Contact or just Contact? Contact, right. I loved that. Um, Great film. And then the Richard Dreyfuss movie, whatever that one was called. <laughs> it's eluding me right now. Um, I can hear the music. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Remember the Richard Dreyfuss I'm, one? I'm tr- yeah, I'm trying to remember the name, though. It, it does escape yeah, me. Yeah, I know. Now. It's a... It's a it's Horrifically famous movie, and, Chat room, and I can't. Why can't you? Movie. Why can't yeah. you answer yeah. for me? But, but what's interesting? Oh, and I love Jurassic World. Close I, you encounters. Know, Jurassic Park was okay, but now that right. I know more about the raptors, I love Jurassic World, and I haven't seen the second one. But here's what's happening. It's like you know, the military has always or has fed the movie producers or the movie screenwriters, you know, somebody, the movie people and the TV people, they have fed them information to to quietly get information out there to see how the public's going to react or to kind of like get us some idea on, you know, what's new. Like uh, the movie Jet Pilot with John Wayne and Vivian Lee, Janet Lee, Janet Lee, not the, not the, not with the wind person, the other one, uh, Janet Lee. Um, so in that movie, it's like it was made in the 50s. Mark's dad and Chuck Yeager were like flying around, like uh, not not as necessarily stunt pilots, but you know they were flying around in new jets because the the Air Force kind of wanted the public to get the idea that you know there's new jets out there and this is cool and and that was fun. And then like Mark and I just watched the movie um, Strategic Air Command, cool movie, you know, probably filmed in the 40s or the 50s after the war, because this is a really good movie just to show you what it's like to be a family with the husband in the Air Force. You know, it's just like here's family life living on the base or living with a guy who's going to not be home very often, and, you know, this is what it was like. It's like, oh, this is cool. But a lot of the movies now, especially with alien stuff, is, again, you know, sometimes our raptor friends are helping finance these movies because they want information coming out about, you know, raptors aren't all bad or aliens aren't all bad. And, and you know, so this is I, – I love that. Understood. And, and that was Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind, by the way. Thank you. Close yes. Encounters. <laughs> I, I mean, I had it in my head. I, I should but know I that. We talk about <laughs> it all the time, and we, we studied that in, in film classes for a long time. But, yes, that that was a good movie. Um, and now that I, I, now that, sorry, I'm yelling. Now that I, um, <laughs> okay. um, have, I'm more into the UFO stuff, I realize, you know, the people at the end of that movie that were walking onto the ship were kind of like that Project Serpo group. They're very similar. You know, yes. so you got a group, they're going up to live in space for a while. Um, and they may never come back. Who knows? Tell me but, about the Raptors when you can. Pardon me? Tell me a little bit more about the Raptors. Oh. The raptors, if you've seen the movie Jurassic World or Park, yes. um, the raptors evolved from uh, – they, they're dinosaurs. They look very much like the velociraptors that are in those movies. They originated here on the planet. They still look like dinosaurs. They're very smart. Millions of years ago, a lot of them left the planet to colonize space, and they have a huge empire out there. They are built to run and – 
Well, let's see. I'm giving my standard speech. Um, they're built to run, so they have very strong tails, very strong legs, very sharp claws on all all four paws. Um, but they're very. They have an opposable. I don't want to call it a thumb, but they have an opposable paw on each, at least of the two front, the two you know paws that we would think of as arms. But um, so they're. You know, people wonder, well, how can they do computers? How can they hold things? I go, well, they can. And they're very smart, and they don't necessarily need their paws to use their computers because they can just think it or talk to their computers. Uh, they're very – they love this planet. They are sick that we have messed it up so much. When we when they left the planet, we were just running around like as little rodents, and they came back, and we were running things here. So that didn't make them happy. Um when they finally came back, they thought they'd only been gone maybe a few thousand years, and they'd been gone millions of years. And that has to do, and I can never explain it very well, it has to do with the whole time-space continuum thingy and the event horizon, and my husband can explain this a whole lot better. But just the way, you know, it gets when you're out in space, um, you might think you're gone a lot longer or not as long as you have been, and you kind of messed them up. But, like, they're... Uh, an, an asteroid hit the planet 65 million years ago, so the ones of them that survived either underground or on the moon or on Mars, they evolved into a more human-looking reptilian that we now call those guys the reptoids, and they're basically the enemies of the raptors, and they don't have a tail, and they work with a lot of terrorists, and they're just nasty. But um, the reptoids, I mean, the raptors, they they love fresh meat. They love live food. They also love human. If you've, they've been on Earth for any time, they love sweets, and they, they've learned to like cooked food, and they like, they're very smart, I said. The more elite of them have operations on their voice boxes so they can speak human languages. They're very educated. They love their families. They have a very strong family life. And they usually have lots of children, you know, several, several from three to the nine at any one hatching. Um, and they could have more than that at one. But, I mean, it's very common for them to have many babies in one brood. Um, let's see what else. Uh, their, em- their empire is run by an empress, and they also have a senate out in their home world, wherever it is. And they're very, they're very advanced, but they tend not to, like, necessarily invent technology. They will steal or borrow somebody else's and then improve upon it for what they need. Um, they have been, they officially became our friends in 1952 when they met Mark's dad and the other military people he was working with here at Am- Hamilton Air Force Base in Northern California. So they, they learned to stop eating humans as a rule. And they've worked with our military ever since. And everything I hear about them is really cool. My they're lot, goodness. And they're a lot of fun. <laughs> right. They and can be a lot of fun, apparently. I'm curious uh, about these, uh, this faction, rather, of species. Are they involved with any abductions here on Earth? Which ones? The reptoids or the raptors? Well, either. Uh, the raptors, no, not anymore. And I don't know if they were ever super big on, you know, kidnapping lots of people. It's not that they've never kidnapped anybody, but they're, the, the ones I, you know, it's, I think it's more of like a, a one or two here and there, like to join my harem type of thing. It's like they're, they're not known as far as I know, and they especially don't do this now, but they're not known for like scooping up hundreds and thousands of people at a time to sell them off into space like numerous species do. Right. The reptoids, on the other hand, are they probably they kidnap the most people of all the species and you know right now they work with ISIS and they've worked with the guy in North Korea and they've worked with other governments to work deals you know you will you know here's our quota we want this many humans especially women and children and we'll give you this technology or we just won't kill you or things like that but I mean if you look at the Middle East especially over these last several years with the, the rise of ISIS and things, um, they they back ISIS and and they, you know, many of those cities were totally destroyed and not all those people made it as refugees to Europe or other parts of, you know, the Middle East or wherever else they were going. I guess some were going to Turkey or whatever. 
you know, a lot of them were scooped up and sent out to space. And are these beings demonic? I, I don't call any of the, the, the aliens demonic. Um, some have pretty negative agendas, but again, that, that implies, and, and like the raptors have a very strong spiritual sense about them. They're very, you know, yes, they can gut you in a second, but only basically if you're attacking them or you're the enemy or whatever. Um, but I don't consider any, any species demonic because right. that implies a Christian religious good, bad, evil thing to that. So You don't believe in evil? I believe there's bad out there. I, I don't believe in the Christian sense of good and evil. Well, you don't have to I be a, a Christian to believe good versus evil. Pardon me? I know a lot of, a lot of, a lot of, but when I, when I hear the stuff demonic, I have had a lot, not so much lately, but I've had several people email me or whatever, contact me yes. and, and just basically say, Essentially, all reptilians are demonic, or all aliens are demonic, and then they start spinning, spinning their religious stuff at me. It's like, okay, the discussion is over. It really does um, happen that way. You're, you're right. Lots of people do mix those things together. Right. I again, I do know that there are several alien species who have very negative agendas, or you know, again, like the reptoids. They would like nothing better than to be in charge and make us all slaves. And, you know, they're fine with terrorizing people, but yeah, I, I'm not fine with that. Yeah, that's kind of evil, I guess we could say, yeah. So, yeah, there is there is good and evil, but I don't, you know, it's like, it's like humans. You know, there's good and evil in there, or light course, and dark and, yes. you know, right and wrong and, and whatever. And, in fact, at the England conference, one of the big discussions – Oh, my cats are awake. They're running around. The cats are awake. Uh, one of the one of the big discussions was, you know, these species. They were having an argument. They wanted, it's like, we want quotas. We want to be able to kidnap X number of people every year, and then we'll trade technology for that. Well, you had certain humans who were fine with that, but you had people like my father-in-law and Admiral Mountbatten and others that were not fine with that, and that was a big, huge argument. And I think we probably lost to a certain point because there were too many side deals and deals that were made that allowed, you know, governments governments allowed these quotas to go on. It's like, sure, you can have this many. and But sometimes the species will go, well, yeah, that's not enough, and we want more. You know, they'll break their own treaty. They'll break the treaties they have because they want the quota to be higher. Yeah, that would make sense. and. We are coming to a close very soon here, Joanne, and I did. Oh, I see that. <laughs> uh, yes, and I did want to ask you about the afterlife <laughs> and your thoughts on the afterlife. The afterlife. Well, that's interesting. Um, I do believe there is an afterlife, and I know that I've had several past lives. I, I no longer believe in it in the strict sense of of the way I was taught about it, like from when I was a Christian for many years, right, whether like it's Methodist mm -hmm. or you know, I don't just necessarily believe in heaven and hell type of thing. I understood. Um, and so do I. I'm with yeah, you on that. I, I, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, um, I belong to a spiritual group. And when we talk about that, it's more like, um, and I won't even call it heaven, but the, the other side is you know, there's this great place and there's this, you know, that we just call it like the divine and it's this fabulous energy. And, you know, and there's, there's multiple species there. So it's humans and, and non-humans and, you know, cats and dogs, that kind of stuff. But, um, it's not like there's one big god with, you know, white god with the, the flowy beard that's sitting on a big chair or anything. So, you know. Right. That's not, not like yeah, that's not yeah. my notion of God either. <laughs> uh, far yeah, from so it. I've changed my opinion a lot, which is, which is rather nice because it, it opens you up to the right. possibility of what, what is there. And, you know, what, you know, and I've had conversations with some wonderful people that are, have passed on the other side and yes. you know, it's fascinating it really is and are you a wicca or wiccan rather i i i i'm a pagan and yes i i don't necessarily follow a specific tradition well you know because i i'm more like the european and english witches and they just call it the craft understood so I yes would, i would like to say that i don't you know, adhere to any one tradition necessarily. But I do, or I do read, I have a lot of books on Wicca and stuff, so, yeah. Okay, very uh -huh. nice. I had no idea. <laughs> a lot of people don't. 
<laughs> yes, and going back, well, before we wrap it up, going back to abduction cases, I it uh-huh. totally slipped slipped my mind. You know, we really don't hear too many stories today about abductions. Yeah, you're right. There isn't uh, that many. Right. It, it, it is happening. Oh, I'm sure um, there is, yeah. It is happening. And, and again, and a lot of times if you just think of, because sometimes when there's natural disasters and a lot of people go missing and their bodies are never recovered, it's because they are taken somewhere else, which is sad to say. Right. Um, so, again, I have learned to think outside the box. Now that I know Mark and he's, you know, given me little tidbits on what really happens when things happen. So sometimes thing, natural disasters can be a cover up for like a huge culling of humans. Or sometimes the natural disaster happens and, oh, by the way, we'll just, you know, scoop up some people or, you know, and again, like the whole thing in Syria is a perfect example. Yes. So, definitely. Now the, the only kind of good news, I guess, um, is sometimes there might be some friendly species out there that will rescue some of the, the kidnapped victims. And, but they, they're not allowed to come back to space. They, I mean, come back to Earth. So now they're just out there, you know, being protected. But it's like, but so they're not, not everybody that's left here is, st- is still in a horrible place and being treated horribly. But because of that whole thing, you know, how, how are you going to be able to survive coming back to Earth and going, ah, you know, I was kidnapped by aliens. <laughs> <laughs> so they're just, a lot of them are allowed to come back. But there are many thousands of people um, that are out, out there being protected and they just can't come back to earth. Amazing. And one more thing I do want to get into here with you before I let you go. Lots of people Uh out there in the conference circuit and just other, other personalities Uh out there, they always talk about a conscious shift and all these sort of things. And it it makes me wonder, but what about the other people that have no interest in any of in in a, a conscious shift per se? The ones who don't care about extraterrestrials or any of these sort of things, my question to them is, what's going to happen to those folks? Are they going to reach that sort of state of enlightenment as the rest of us? That's a good question because if you if you turn it around, um, my brother, bless his soul, and no names, but you know him and other people I know, they're they're very very strict Christians right? and you know, they believe in the rapture or whatever you want to call it. Now, number one, because I was a Mormon, a lot of people thought I was going to hell for being in a Mormon, but a lot, uh, again, there's other Christians out there and no offense to Christians because I have good friends who are, but um, you know, they think that that's going to be it. And you know, it's like, well, I, there's more to me, you know, there's just more out there than just the one narrow Christian view of what's out there because there's so many planets and universes out there that, you know, how do you think? You think there's just all humans out there because humans can't survive in all the, the, the environments that are out there. So you have to have something that can survive out there. So I think, I think it'll be a little waking up. I don't think it's going to be, well, if you don't believe in aliens, you're going to hell type of thing. You know, I don't think, I don't, I don't think that. Right. Um, and I will say, again, I was at the Dimensions of Disclosure Conference, and I thought, well, you know, I don't fit in with the consciousness group <laughs> until I got there. And, you know, two of the, my favorite quotes are from the spiritual thinking of the raptors. I go, well, this fits right in with the whole consciousness theme because these creatures are some of the most spiritual creatures I know of. And I tear up every time I give these quotes. So it's like, oh, so again, that was a little shift for me. It's like, oh, I do belong here. I am able to talk to these people, even though I don't necessarily am familiar with a lot of things they're talking about. You know, I don't know what third and fourth density is and all these terms they were throwing out. It's like, (laughs) I have no idea what you're talking about, but it's still amazing. Thanks for letting me me be here. (laughs) Uh, No problem. Yes. And it's still amazing that you could interact with these people when you look them in the eye and you do gain some sort of credibility uh, for, right. for a lot of the stories they tell you. Yeah, and it's, it's interesting because at the very beginning of that conference, for example, the, the host or whatever, the MC asked how many people that was their first time. And a ton of people, it was their first time going to any conference at all. 
And I was so thrilled because we had speakers and workshops going on at the same time every day. And I still had, and there were at least 400 people at the whole conference because that's how many of the auditorium held and it was full when we all got together for joint things. And, and I would say I had a pretty big crowd for my talk and most of them, I'm sure there's people who didn't believe me and that's okay, but I had so many who were so grateful for the information that I brought there because it was different than what a lot of people were talking about and it's different than what they had heard about. And so I was just thrilled at, you know, their level of appreciation for that. And I made a lot of new good friends that way. So like in two weeks, I'm going to be at Portals of the, Portals to Ascension, Portals of Ascension. Nice. It's a conference in Irvine in, uh, yeah, two weeks, the first weekend of October. And I'm just going to be there as a vendor. But again, I was thinking, well, you know, this is like a consciousness or awareness or, you know, I don't, I wasn't much into the concept of ascension, and I'm not putting anybody down. It's just that's not the path I was, you know, I'm, I'm talking about aliens. Understood, yes. So it's like, but it's like, oh, now these people, now I understand what they're talking about. And it's like, oh, I, I've met a lot of these people now. So it's like, cool, now I feel like I fit in. Because I asked the host, I go, are you sure my information about aliens is going to fit in? He goes, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, okay. <laughs> right, and then after it's all said and done, you kind of miss the people you interacted with at these places. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it's it's an, it's it brought me to a whole new group of people that I can interact with and learn from them, and they can learn from me. And and it's nice because it's not the same necessarily the same group of people that have gone to all the other conferences I go to. So it was it was good for me to be there. Understood. And I'm look, I'm looking forward to going to the next one. Perfect. And then um, the end of October, I'll be speaking in Albuquerque. So that's a stargate to the cosmos. So I've got two conferences coming up. Yeah, and that's another hotbed for all sorts of strange activity. I know. <laughs> My yeah, goodness. we'll be at we'll be in Albuquerque. So that's not far from that sunspot observatory, I think. <laughs> yeah, it's not. You should definitely ask around. I will. I will. <laughs> oh yes, definitely ask around and give me some information if you can. I. Yeah, yeah. It's like Mr. Captain Richards is tight-lipped about this one. <laughs> <laughs> so, Joanne, once again, I do want to thank you tremendously for being a part of the program. It's been an absolute well, honor and, and just a pleasure to have you here back again. Well, thank you so much for having me. And um, let me throw out my website. It's www.edhca.org or edhq.org. I have two websites. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Joanne. It's been fun, and I can't believe it's already over, how time just flies. I know, I know. <laughs> Good Lord. Okay, Joanne, we'll, we'll definitely have to touch base again and bring, bring you back here. Okay, thank you so much. All right, no problem. Thank you for being okay. here. All right, good night. Okay, bye. And there she goes. That was Joanne Richards. Amazing. I loved having her on the program. She was here, episode one, and now back again. It's just a... Fantastic evening, and I'm so proud of the program, and I'm proud of all the listeners out there who have shown nothing but support for this amazing program, really. It's tremendous, and I'm looking at the time here. We are a little early, but we are going to go on a little break right now, and when I return, another guest joins us here live. Mr. John Olson is patiently awaiting, so we will bring him on. In a few moments here, everyone be patient and stay tuned. We'll be right back. You know, I listened to the end of day's radio tonight, the show, and I got to tell you, you know, I thought it was pretty good, but I got to tell you, I, I would like to hear more about Miss Oglin. You talked about a lot of stuff, but I didn't hear much about Miss Oglin. Maybe next time. You know, you guys do a good job. I just want to say thank you to the end of day's, but... Next time, let's let's talk about Miss Oakland a little more. And welcome back to the program. And on the line with me now is Mr. John Olson. What's going on, my friend? Are you alive and well? I am alive and well. Thank you so much, Michael. Amazing. I'm so glad you can be here. I'm just so excited to be here before all of you out there and yourself, John. I am just electrified here tonight. I appreciate you having me on the show. This is great. Amazing. Now, John, go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself and your trials and tribulations. I would love to hear all about you. So um, 
I'm actually a paranormal author, uh, an investigator. Uh, I interview people who have had uh, paranormal things happen in their life. Uh, a lot of people come to me with their stories, and it, you know, it everything from ghosts, hauntings, UFOs, Bigfoot, um, cryptids, you name it. People, people come to me, and and I, I get their story and. I've uh, currently written two books, working on my third, and uh, it's just been a wonderful journey. It really has. It really has. You have some fantastic books. I've got a chance to look at them. I haven't read all of them, of course, but just very briefly have gone over them. And my goodness, you definitely are very well researched. Oh, well, thank you. I, it's, it's interesting. Um, where my journey started, uh, I grew up in a small town in northern Utah, and uh, the house that I grew up in was over a 100 years old. Uh, it had uh, been actually purchased originally and built by the railroad and then sold, um, and when I was living in it, like I said, it was well over a 100 years old, and it was an extremely active house. A uh, lot of things went on as I was growing up, and uh, by the time I was about 8, 10 years old, I realized my house was not like my friend's house. Oh, my things goodness. that were going on that, you know, was abnormal. Yeah, let me just quickly add, uh, what was it like growing up, curious about all your paranormal experiences, especially coming from a place where that sort of curiosity is along the lines of taboo? Yeah, it, well, it's interesting because uh, as I started noticing things, um, I have an older sister. She's about four years older than me, and I have a younger brother that's about a year and a half younger than me. You have a lot of family. And, yeah, we do. Oh my. Um, and uh, but as we start, as I started noticing things, and we started talking about it, um, my parents uh, were very. I, I guess I should say they were very strict about making sure that we didn't talk about it. Um, and and that comes from a place where. Um, you know, in a small town, there's two things that people love to do. One, gossip, and two, stay out of gossip. <laughs> Sounds and, like my town. <laughs> yeah. A lot of small towns are like that. Right. I guess a lot of big towns, too, neighborhoods. But right. um, So my parents were very worried about us talking about it, and they didn't want people to think we were crazy or anything like that. So we found that we, as kids, could talk about it, but – uh, talking to my parents, you know, they didn't, they didn't want to talk about it. Later on, you know, as I got older, I realized that my parents were also having experiences and they knew that the house was haunted, but, oh. you know, they didn't want, you know, didn't want people to talk about us. Were, so, were mom and dad raising you in a religious household, John? Yes. I, oh, okay. I was raised in uh, an LDS um, home. Understood. Uh, and uh so yeah and so yeah it was kind of a thing where you know we didn't want people to talk about us my parents didn't it was and and you know back then so this is you know 35 years ago yeah, the paranormal and things like that wasn't as openly talked about as it is now it's kind of more accepted um and i find you know with my books people are you know opening up and talking to me but back then it was really kind of taboo Oh, of course. I could only imagine, especially with the parents, your parents around, they didn't want uh, little John to be corrupted. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Right. And, and um, yeah, like I said, they probably they were worried about people talking about it. Um, but, you know, as as we've gotten older and as I've written the books, obviously, you know, they they've opened up. They've shared their experiences, you know, with me and. And they're a lot more open. They actually still live in the home, uh, and it is still active. So they are and open. So, they are open about these things. They don't exactly see you as the proverbial black sheep of the family, then. No, no. In fact, right, my older sister, right. she she started a little paranormal group, and and she does some of her own paranormal things. You know, growing up in that atmosphere and having those experiences, which I'd I love to touch on. Sure, uh, sure. It, it changes your life. You know it. it it directs you in your life. So understood. And I, myself, I have experienced some strange things a number of times. Mm -hmm. And even, even with family and people close to me, even with strangers, I've, I've had these shared experiences remarkably. 
But even yeah. then, the skeptical side of me still feels perhaps there is a perfectly good explanation for some of these things, but not all. Not right. All. Correct. Right. Um, and it's interesting, too. One thing that I found growing up in in a situation where I, you know, saw paranormal things happen uh, frequently, there would be, you know, it'd go months and nothing would happen. And then there would be two weeks of of just, you know, really active things that went on. But um, I tell I tell this story. This is interesting. It's actually when I was older. It's been about four years ago. Um, my parents were on vacation. They asked me if I wanted to come and uh, just house sit while they were gone for the weekend. And I said, yeah, you know, that'd be great. And so me and my youngest son were there and uh, we watched TV until about 11. And then I took him to bed. He was asleep. And my mother has uh, a little Shih Tzu dog. And his name is Bassa, which is uh, kind of a weird name, but um, you can't use that foul language here, John. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> it's, it's, it's there's a funny story behind that name too, but I won't get into that right now. <laughs> but, um, but he usually sleeps with my parents, and he would usually sleep with whoever was staying there. If it was just my brother or whatever. Um, and so he was in the kitchen. Uh, the dog was, and in his little bed. And I, you know, I asked him. I said, "Hey, let's go to bed. Let's go to bed." And, he just kind of looked at me and then went back to sleep in his bed. And I said, well, you know, you can sleep there then. So I went upstairs um, uh, where me and my son were sleeping in my old bedroom and um, went to bed. And about 2 o'clock in the morning, I woke up and I could just hear this terrible racket. And the dog was barking his head off and there was there was just really loud noise going on. So I, I headed downstairs and just as I hit the bottom step, it – it, the noise went quiet. The dog barked a couple times and then and then stopped. And so I walked around the corner and into the kitchen where the dog was and turned on the light. And I realized what the sound had been. Um, all of the cupboards in the entire kitchen were in different states of open. And and it hit me that that was what the sound was. Was the the cupboards and doors and everything was were flying open and banging and banging. And uh, I found poor Bassa. He was under the table just shaking. And so I, I scooped him up and just checked the doors and then just went, you know, went back to bed. And I've had when I tell people that story, they're like, well, weren't you scared to death? You know, you know, and I said, when you grow up in a house where things like that happen, it really doesn't bother me that much. I just went back and went back to bed, you know. Yeah. And for sure. Some of these experiences would definitely freak people out. Right. Especially in your, in your home. And have you looked, maybe perhaps researched a little bit into the house you live in? Yes. So the, you mean the, the home that my parents live yeah, in? Yeah, your parents um, live in, correct. Yes. Um, yeah. So I went back and, and, and have done research. And like I said, it was originally built by the railroad. Um, back in the day, uh, that's how the government paid the railroad was by giving them land. And then they would build or sell that off to pay them to the settlers that were coming in. And um, it passed in, into my family, a distant family, um, and then down through the generation. Um, it was actually abandoned for about 15 years before my parents purchased it and then moved in and then started doing repairs and adding on to it. And, and But it was a farmhouse for um, a good-sized farm. Uh, for many, many years since it was uh, originally built. Um, there, there is a one apparition that I have seen and my mother has seen and actually everybody in the family has seen. Um, when I was about, oh, uh, in the eighth grade, I remember I came home from school and I made myself a sandwich and I went in the front room and sat down on the couch to watch some TV and kind of decompress from school. And out of the corner of my eye, I saw something, and I looked up, and here's a extremely tall uh, individual with a wide-brimmed hat. I could tell he had a white shirt and overalls on, but I couldn't make out the distinction in his face because he was see-through, and I couldn't get in see uh, so much of his face. Wow. And he walked across the room and then sat in the uh, rocking chair that was across from me. And, and just started rocking in the chair. And it was the first time that I had actually seen the, the ghost, I guess. And so, you know, I, at the time I was, I was kind of frightened. So I closed my eyes and counted to 10 
And when I opened my eyes, uh, he was gone and the, the chair was just slowly rocked a little bit and then stopped. Um, but when I went through looking at the history of the house, ah, yes. When my grandparents passed away, uh, they had a stack of all kinds of photographs and I came across a photograph of <clears throat> a distant uncle that had owned the house, um, in the, near the turn of the century. And sure enough, he's standing there, an extremely tall, skinny man in overalls and a white shirt and a wide brim hat. And then it realized, it hit me that that was who it was, uh, that I had seen in the house. Yeah, and were you afraid? Did you have any fear when you saw this strange entity looking at you? When I, yeah, when it originally happened, yeah, it was such a shock that, that I was, I was afraid. Oh my. Um, but I can't, I can't say that, um, anything that's happened in the house has, has ever been necessarily, um, a, a bad feeling to it or anything like that. I, I believe it's just in one or two individuals who have passed away in the house mm. that just remain there. Understood because I understand Utah is just filled with all sorts of history, amazing history, by the way. And, yeah. but there are lots of illness and tragedies that did occur in there. And I can imagine that some sort of unbearable energy would definitely have had passed through certain homes. Right, right. And if that was, you know, this individual's home when during his lifetime, I imagine that that's where he feels comfortable. And it's interesting, too, because I've had a lot of people that are that say, oh, well, why don't you have the house cleaned, you know, cleansed, you know, drive out whatever may be there. And, and my response to that is, you know, this was his house in, in his lifetime. It's still kind of his house. And so, you know, he has every right to be there as much as we do. No doubt, no doubt. And of course, I'm wondering about mom and dad. Have they seen anything as of late? Um, you know, they, they do, um, they do tell me a few things that have, that happen. Um, here at, interesting enough, at the beginning of the year, my wife and I uh, had sold our house and we were planning on, on moving, but our house sold so quick, we ended up with a month where we didn't have anywhere to live. We were just going to rent. And my parents said, no, you know, the upstairs is basically just an apartment, you know, come stay here for a month. And so we said, okay, you know, we'll do that. And my wife, she was a little concerned because she knows about the history and about the ghost and, and she just visiting has heard, uh, heard the ghost. And I said, you know, if I, if I say that he's not going to bother you, you know, not to bother you that you're, you know, you're afraid of it, then he, he'll leave you alone. Something attached itself to you, right, John? Well, uh, yeah. So, um, I have another story to tell you. Moved, Go ahead though. Yes. No, I was going to say, um, we were there, you know, for a month, a little over a month and right near the month part, my wife said, Oh, you know, it's interesting nothing has happened. And I said, well, it's because I said, you know, don't bother. <laughs> right. Don't bother you. She, yes. You know, and I said, and then I kind of jokingly said out loud, well, if you're okay with it, I'm sure he'd love to, you know, let you know he's here. And she said, no, no, no. But oddly enough, it was either that very next morning or a, a couple mornings after that. I had got, I get up, I had gotten up really early and gone to work and, um, uh, she was laying in bed and something uh, curled up next to her and, and ran his fingers through her hair. And she all of a sudden realized that I had gone to work about an hour ago and she jumped out of bed and there was nothing there. But that was him kind of saying, hello, I, hello, I'm here. <laughs> yes. But isn't, uh, that, isn't that amazing? Yeah, it is. It's, it's interesting. But it, it, he was kind enough to leave her alone as long as, you know, we said, you know, don't don't bother her. But then. The minute she felt comfortable enough, he thought it would be fun to tease her, so he did. <laughs> yeah, luckily, that's a very playful type of uh, spirit that does linger around. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I asked if, if this was possibly attached to you is early on in my earliest years in high school, I would play guitar a lot with a friend of mine. We were actually in a band, and we would play at a cemetery, and I can't, well... We were we were playing there to practice for a very long time with mm -hmm. acoustic guitars, and we did this for a very long time. And, John, I have to say, honestly, in my opinion, I think something definitely did attach itself to me. Ah, yes. Mm -hmm. I think it's very true because lots of strange things were occurring after. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe three months after, 
that's when I started um, having these weird sort of feelings and hearing strange things in the house at times. Right. And my yes. parents can, my parents can uh, definitely, uh, ba- go to bat for me on this one too, because they did have that sort of experience when I was in high school at their home, right. at their house. Yeah. Right. Definitely. And then, and I have stories of, uh, in my books where, you know, places can be haunted, uh, and attached to people or even things. Um, I have an interesting story in my um, newest book of, uh, a, a lady who had purchased some tools because she loves antique things. And, uh, when she brought the tools home, there was, uh, an entity attached, attached to the tools that started interacting with her children. And, um, eventually when she finally figured out that this uh, one night, it was interesting. She had an 18 month old daughter and, uh, her and her husband were in bed just talking and all of a sudden a, uh, uh, an older gentleman started singing when she, when her daughter started fussing and they heard an older gentleman start singing in a foreign language, kind of a lullaby to her. And they, they freaked out and ran down the hall, but there was nobody in there. Um, and then that had happened a couple of times. And then their daughter that was, I think four years old started talking to an imaginary friend that was a, a grandpa character that she talked about. And eventually she figured out that this entity had come home with the um the cobbler tools that she had purchased um and as soon as she returned the, those uh, tools back uh, to the shop she'd got them from the the entity left again so definitely it can be attached to people things or a place i believe right and one of the strangest things that did happen to me at my parents home uh, just recently too well not okay. that recent but just maybe Four, four months ago, probably, mm-hmm. I was with my dad and there was no one else in the house and we were watching some sort of boxing event, I believe. Do you like boxing, by the way? I do. Yeah. Oh, perfect. I'm glad you do. I'm glad you are a man. <laughs> I do. Yes. I do. Perfect. Perfect. So we're watching some boxing and the strangest thing does occur. Um, there's like a, I guess, like a fruit sort of basket there uh next to the, the television with all sorts of things and literally i saw i believe it might have been a grape uh, a grapefruit it, uh-huh. it literally just bounced up and off of it off of the plate yeah oh man and i we we literally thought someone was in the house and we looked around and we called for my mom uh, nobody was there it was just me and my dad oh wow so, yeah, it was very strange. I have no idea what the hell happened. And me and my father were both uh, kind of confused. And before that, we were watching The Preacher before we changed it over to boxing. Uh, the uh-huh. Preacher is a, an amazing program, by the way. Mm-hmm. It I'm is. Not, I love that program. Yeah. I've only seen a couple episodes, but I definitely want to get further into it. I've, I've really appreciated that. Me too. It's insane, right? Yeah, it is. Uh, it's like a breath of fresh air. Yeah. Oh, I love yeah. it. Very much like this program, it's a breath of fresh effing air. I can't, right. I can't curse, but <laughs> yes, it's a, it's very good to have this sort of organic conversation, not to give you questions before we go on the air. It's a lot more, mm-hmm. I guess, intimate and it's more realistic than say other interviewers out there. And that's why I really like the show. It's an open mm-hmm. discussion and you can disagree with me anytime, by the way, John. That's something right. I do need to tell the guests uh, because sometimes sometimes I think they're a little intimidated of me. Oh, <laughs> no, no, I, I'm not at all. So good, don't be afraid. Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, I, this is the thing. It's interesting. I have, I have, because of the the paranormal and my research and you know speaking to people and everything. I I've gotten friends from all walks of life, all different you know, religions. I have, I have friends who are pagans and Wiccans and, um, you know, I have uh, a few Muslim friends at work. And, and so, you know, it's just all about being, you know, you don't have to agree with everybody, but it's about being respectful and, and just, you know, everything like that. Yeah. And that's one thing I feel that lots of people, when they come on to certain programs, they don't want to, I guess, get into some sort of confrontation right. with the host. But in my opinion, I would love for you to disagree with me or even agree with me. 
Mm-hmm. It's it's totally fine. I I don't come from a place of anger or hate or any of those things because I don't take any of this personal. Yeah, right. And that's exactly. what a lot of people they they don't know how to do that. They become personally invested, and that's mm-hmm. when the anger comes in and all of that all of that noise. And John, by the way, have you gone rid of your anger? Yeah, I, I'm I'm a fairly calm person, I have to say. I'm a fairly calm person. Perfect. Now, I coach football, a little league football oh, and a yes. high school football. And so that has come up <laughs> with anger in that aspect of right. sports. But but no, yeah, I, I feel like I'm a very calm person when it comes to most things. And, Beautiful. And being able to deal with, with people and situations, it's very important. So. It, it really is, and that's wonderful that you do acknowledge that. Because anger you do not want to have in your life that leads to other things, other illnesses that come from anger. Right. Oh, exactly. I, I've been reading a lot about, um, just the power of positive thought and putting positive thoughts out there. Right. And, and and I believe the way you treat people in, in your life is, is going to come back to you. It definitely. It, It really is. And you know, I had this conversation earlier about karma. You know, mm-hmm. karma is something I don't exactly really subscribe to in the sense of just karma, the the, the term. I think it's right. a lot more complex than that. I think sometimes right. the universe does give us these signs, yet human error is what mm-hmm. really causes it. Because if karma did exist, the earth would not cease to exist. Right, right, exactly. And, and you know, there, there are going to be people out there that are going to, to treat you poorly or do something to you that you cannot control. Um, right. But, but what you can control is your reaction to it. And, Indeed. And so that's important. You got to pick and choose what does trigger you. Yes, exactly. I'm so and, glad that you are a man and that you have come to realize all these things, uh, John. Yes. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Amazing. And I'm still curious about the locations in Utah and I'm curious now, are, are there any sort of conferences that do go on in your area, John? Yes, actually, I am uh, speaking in on October 6th uh, is the Utah Paranormal Conference down in Salt Lake. Um, I'll be one of the speakers at it. Um, I don't have the list in front of me, but they've got uh, some great uh, guests coming. Uh, Chip Coffee is going to be there, and there's some others, too. Chip Coffee. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's a name yeah. I haven't heard in a while. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, right? And so, yeah, there are, you know, quite a bit that's going on, uh, with just different stuff like that. That's the big one that's coming up that I'm kind of focusing on right now. But, um, yeah, it's, you know, Utah is a, a pretty diverse place now. I mean, it's in the past, maybe not so much, but definitely now it's, it's a lot more, um, you know, open minded people. Uh, I wouldn't be able to do this, say, 20, 30 years ago, I wouldn't have been able to do what I do with uh, investigating. And, right. And what's what's great is what my books, I feel like, have done in the area that I'm at, um, in the western United States, is uh, allowed people to come forward with their stories and feel comfortable about it. Now, there's yeah. a lot of stories that I've had to change the names because they've asked me in, to change the names in the books. Oh, but, yeah. But I – but – well, and, and just to go back maybe a little bit of okay. how I started with this, uh, with the investigation, like I was saying, um, I wasn't allowed to talk about it a lot when I was younger. Um, but when I got to be a teenager, um, I had some friends that would come over to the house and they would have experiences at my house. Uh, for example, I was, I was one night, I was studying with a friend. We were studying for a biology test and, um, all of a sudden, we were upstairs, and all of a sudden, she just throws the biology book down on the floor and just stares at me. And I was, and I said, "What? What's what's the matter?" You know? And she said, "Well, what's going on?" And I said, "What do you mean, what's going on?" And she says, "Well, we've been up here for 45 minutes, and three times somebody has run up the stairs, but there's nobody there." And I'm like, "Oh," I said, um, "That's the stair monster. That's what we as kids called it." Because that was one thing that happened a lot. There's one steep staircase that goes from the main floor up to the the second floor. And at any time during the day, you could hear footsteps or running up and down the stairs. So as kids, when we were little, we we nicknamed it the stair monster. 
And I said, well, that's just the stair monster. And she looked at me and I said, well, you know, my house is, is haunted. I live in a haunted house. And so as some of my friends realized that my house was haunted and that I had some interesting stories to tell, I would be at a party or we'd be out on double dates or wherever as a teenager. And inevitably one of my friends would say, Hey, you know, did you guys know John's house is haunted? Have him tell stories. <laughs> and so oh. I would tell my stories and it wasn't long before people would come back to me a day or two later alone, not in the group and say, you know, I had this experience, you know, and so they would share their story with me. And then it wasn't long, probably around 17, 18 years old tops. Um, I started saying, you know, can I document, you know, your story? I want to write a book someday. And so a lot of people would let me take their story. And, and like I say, a lot of them wanted their name changed, which I'm fine with. But that's how I kind of got started originally with getting stories from people and and collecting their stories. Yeah, definitely. You interviewed a lot of people and you spent so much time, a tremendous, uh, a tremendous bit of time, I must say, researching the paranormal and interviewing all sorts of people. Mm -hmm. And John, there had, there, there had to be at times where you interviewed some people and you thought, okay, this is just way too outlandish. I don't believe a word. There's, there's got to be. You know, there's, there's times when I'll, 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 I'll get a story from somebody and I just have to go with a gut feeling of, you know, of, of the story. And it's actually very rare that I feel like somebody's not being genuine or, uh, kind of, uh, ill you know, embellishing the story right how do you discern that john that's that should have been the better question you know i do i i just have to go with my gut uh it's it's interesting when i when i meet people i just feel like i you know some people come across super genuine and, and honestly i think there's a lot of people that are that are that are more genuine than say people who are uh looking to embellish or make up a story because there's so many of them that, that say, you know, they start out with, you know, I'm not crazy or, you know, I'm really not a weirdo, but this happened to me. Um, it's interesting, though, probably one of the strangest stories, uh, that I've gotten. It's in, it's actually in my new book, uh, Beyond Stranger Bridgeland. Um, and I, I got this story from an individual and sitting down and talking with him, uh, you know, as outlandish as the story is, and I'll get into it. And, and tell you the story. Yes. I honestly believe the guy because as he's telling the story to me, I am feeling and sensing his, um, fear of what happened to him. So, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll explain kind of what happened to him in his story. Yeah. Uh, he had moved to, um, this area. I live in, uh, Northern Utah, which is, uh, it's called Cash Valley. Um, uh, it's just a small valley up here in Northern Utah. Uh, and he had moved here because he'd come to visit a friend at school. Uh, Utah State University is up here. And he'd fell in love with the area because he was an outdoorsman. He loved, you know, biking, hiking, rock climbing. And, and, and if you love that stuff, this is the place for you. There's just outdoors everywhere. Yeah, it's you're, a beautiful location, by the way. You no, know, yes, thank you. It's, you're mm -hmm. never 10 minutes from a, a place to fish or a place to hike or anything like that. Yeah, it's beautiful. Um, he and he one day he had planned a trip uh, to go with one of his friends on a hike to a peak called Mount Naomi. It's not a, it's not a real long hike, but they had planned to spend the night uh, just to make kind of a two day trip out of it. Well, at the last minute, his friend had to cancel and he decided he would go anyway. He wanted to go by himself. Um, when we all talk about when we're in our 20s, we're indestructible and. And we're not afraid of anything. Isn't that, isn't that amazing when we're that young? We really yeah. do think that we're on top of the world and nothing could ever harm us. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Amazing. Um, yeah. It's, it's a mindset that takes a while to get past for sure. It but. really is. You, uh, speaking for myself, I did have a nihilistic perspective on the world. Mm -hmm. And yeah, all of that I, really, I too. yeah, all of that does fade away though in time. Life. Will definitely definitely beat you down. Yeah, it does. It has it a does. to do that. And and what for me when I had children and and seeing the things that they go through, it 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 helped me realize that you know 
things are precious and you've got to be careful. But uh, anyway, he'd uh, he had gone on this trip and he'd hiked up a certain you know, distance and it's a high of ele- elevation. I can't remember exactly what the elevation is, but you're up near the tree line when you get up pretty far up. And um, it was getting a little later because it was later for him uh, to have left. So he makes camp. Um, at the time, there was a, a, a burn restriction, so he couldn't have a fire. So he had just taken stuff that he could eat um, out of his pack. And he ate and set out his bedroll and uh, watched the stars. And he said he always brought a headlamp and a book uh, to read before he went to bed. So he read a little bit in his book and then had drifted off to sleep. Uh, he woke in the middle of the night, and he woke to a start. And it was strange, he said, because he's usually a very heavy sleeper, and it takes a lot to wake him up. And when he woke up, he wasn't sure what had waken, what had woken him up. And uh, he noticed that it was very still. There was no sounds whatsoever, uh, which he found very strange. Uh, and he was trying to go back to sleep and couldn't. And suddenly he started hearing a whistle coming from not very far away from him. But it wasn't a bird whistle or anything. It was almost something, a whistle that you would hear when somebody's trying to get your attention. Oh. And so he, he gets up and he's starting to get nervous at this point. Uh, he gets his shoes slipped on and he's looking for his headlamp. He can't find his headlamp. And all of a sudden he gets hit in the chest with a, a rock about the size of a quarter. And he said it wasn't hard. It wasn't thrown at him hard, but it was enough to get his attention. And so, and the whistling had stopped, and it was at that point he realized, oh, my headlamp is still on my head. So he flipped his headlamp on, and he said he turned to his right, and there was a, a pile of, of rocks not far, about 15 feet from from him. And when he looked at the pile of rocks, there was a creature sitting on the pile of rocks. He said it, if it was standing up straight, it would have been about four feet tall. Um, it was green. And gray, and its color of skin was green and gray. Oh, wow. Its, its ears were pointed. Its nose were pointed. Almost like um, uh, when he's explaining this, uh, I'm thinking of um, the uh, goblins in Harry Potter kind of a thing. And he said it was wearing ragged clothes and just sitting on the rock, uh, staring at him, had black eyes. And he kind of is in shock. Um, and... Out of nowhere, it starts whistling at him. That's when it realizes, oh, that's where the whistling was. It's this creature that was whistling at me. And as Oof. he's as as he's staring at that this creature, um, he notices it's got something in its hand, and it's uh, and it's kind of sliding it behind itself. And he looks, and it's his book that he was reading before he went to sleep. The creature's taken it from him, and. He realizes that whatever this is has been close enough to him to have taken the book out from underneath him. And it kind of snaps him out of this, this, you know, day's, uh, you know, shock. And he just scoops up all of his stuff and, and runs for the trail, trips near the trail. Uh, as he's gathering up his stuff, the, he hears the whistle coming. It's closer, gets his stuff and just runs down, uh, ran all the way back down the trail to his vehicle and left. And he said, you know, I've never, as he's telling me this story, he says, I've never had a a paranormal experience before this. I've never had one since then. He said, I wanted it to be just a dream. I wanted it to be my imagination. He says, and it wasn't. It was as real as you standing before me. And he says, I know how crazy that sounds. I, I understand how crazy it sounds. Um, but he says it was true. It happened to him. And, uh, I just, the fear in his voice when he was telling me this story. You were sold. Um, I, I was. Yeah. I, I, I honestly believe that, that, that he believes what he saw, if that right. makes sense. I, I can't understand. verify for sure that, that it happened, but I can tell you that he believes that that is what happened to him. Understood. He wholeheartedly believed that this right. experience did take place. Right. Perhaps and, it really did. Yeah, and well, and it's interesting because after I get a story like this, I I want to try and do research to find out is there another story like it out there? Is there any kind of collaboration? And what led me down it led me down an interesting path of the Native Americans 
who uh, now in the Native Americans, all of their history and folklore and everything is been passed down uh, through um, just verbal, uh, you know, not written down. But they do have uh, stories of small creatures that fit that description. They're called Pogwaji. Uh, at least that's what one of the tribes called them. And um, they tell of them trying to lure people away and being tricksters and um, just doing things, uh, stealing from people. And so I don't know if he ever had heard of that, but there was a correlation between what he saw and some of the folklore through the Native Americans. Yeah, since we're talking about the Native Americans, in your book, you covered all sorts of cryptids, and one of them being Bigfoot. Mm -hmm. And yes. I must say, I sort of lost hope in the possibility of a Bigfoot existing today, mm -hmm. but I, I definitely don't disparage the sort of idea that Bigfoot did exist at one time. Right. And furthermore, I have to say, I also feel TV shows about Bigfoot <laughs> really just diminished a, a lot of that belief for me. Right. I mean, I think it did that for everyone out there, too. I, I think, um, I think, you know, for the average person, individual who may not, who may be, you know, somewhat interested in it, but not deep into it, uh, I'm sure that some of those Bigfoot shows were very, uh, entertaining. But for those that interview people and go out, and I, I've got a lot of friends who, um, do real research on it, uh, it's, it, it did kind of, seem deflated kind of it kind of deflated the whole a little thing. bit it's, yeah it's, yeah it's, it's the same thing as the ghost hunting shows as well mm -hmm. they're always yeah. hosted by these very questionable char characters at times yeah and and you know it's 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 done a lot for having you know since you have some of these ghost hunting shows now you've got a lot of groups out there you know that go out on the weekend and, and do ghost hunts and stuff and i think Honestly, I think there's, that's great, and I love that people are interested in that. The oh, yeah. one thing that I tell people who, who are going to make a group or go start investigating things, I say, you know, the two things that I would suggest is, one, not to get into anything too dark that may attach to you. You know, if you want to go, you know, do investigations and stuff, great. Just be careful with, I would say, maybe the occult or something of that nature. Sure. And the other thing is, too, is to be respectful, because I know not too far from where I live, there is a um, there is a place. It's called the Bear River Massacre Spot. It's where it's actually one of the worst um, massacres that occurred to the Shoshone Indians. Oh, wow. And um, and is actually, you know, a fairly active spot. I, I have several stories from people who have who have. Uh, who've had interactions there and I haven't, I haven't got them in my books yet because I want to do it in a way that's respectful and, you know, in telling the story, because I think that it's, it's good for people to hear the story, but I want to be respectful. Understood, so yes. getting back to the, the groups, I would just say, you know, uh, you know, you might want to avoid places like that, especially if you're going to, uh, there's some ghost hunter places that love to go into places and they, uh, Oh, what do they call it? Where they, they're, they're disrespectful to, to the ghost or they try and provoke them and provoking and stuff like that. And yeah, doesn't and that I, look so silly though? Yeah, it does. And I, I often tell people, I say, well, if you have somebody who has a, you know, a, a ghost or a problem and then you invite somebody into your house to investigate it and they provoke or do anything like that and then leave, that to me is the exact same as if I had a hornet's nest and I called the exterminator and he came out and just threw rocks at it and then went home. That was not helpful. That was the opposite of helpful. Uh, right. And one of, one of the stories that sort of did make me believe that a Bigfoot definitely could be possible is the story of Zana. That's the Russian Bigfoot. Oh, yes. I've, I've read quite a bit about that. that Isn't that amazing, that, that story? That is, and I love the fact that, that she still has descendants that they could, you know, get DNA from, hopefully. That's right. Uh, what, one of the interesting things I thought about that story was the fact when she was held captive that she would dig a hole under underground and she would sleep in there. Mm -hmm. Because I heard so many stories of Bigfoot 
uh, that that's what they would do. They'd live underground. Right. Right. So I always I, thought, wow, that's incredible. And reading that story so long ago, because someone did bring that story up to, uh, they brought it up again to me. And I thought, wow, it's been so long since I've heard about this. Mm -hmm. And yeah, Zana, the, the, the Russian Bigfoot. Russian Bigfoot. And yeah, they, that was a really good story. It's insane. That. It's such a great story. And of course, the villagers, they used her for, as a slave and of course for breeding. Mm -hmm. She had allegedly three hybrids, if I recall the story, how it goes. Right. Uh, my God, isn't that insane? That's, that is wow. crazy. Yeah. And they <laughs> ended up having to, the first couple she had passed away because she would take them down and throw them in the cold river to wash them. And then they would end up dying from freezing. And they ended up after she had, I think her second or third, the villagers started taking them away from her after she had them so that the, she wouldn't accidentally kill them. That's so. one. Well, that's three brave men who <laughs> had a child with whatever that was. Yes. Yes. Courageous. Exactly. And, that is yeah. that is courageous right there. <laughs> it is. And it's amazing that oh lets you know that the um, genetics have to be close enough to us uh, in order for, you know, them to breed. So. Good Lord, I just can't even believe what that, what the whole site would have been just to have been a villager and seeing a uh, Bigfoot right before you and then the villagers actually using this thing to breed with. I mean, you really can't write a better story. Right, I, you couldn't. That's, that's right. My that's what, God. That's funny because, you know, you, I find that, that sometimes the, the true stories are stranger than fiction, and that's for sure. No um, doubt. So. No doubt. So Bigfoot has always been one of those cryptids, in my opinion, that are just so hard to believe that they exist right now in the current time that we live in. But, I mean, I could be completely wrong. You know, it's interesting. I, I've i been interviewed, you know, several people who have, who have had run-ins with um, Sasquatch and Bigfoot. And um, the more, you know, I hear, the more I wonder if there's not – not that it's not a real – live um creature but that there isn't something paranormal about it uh that's allowing it to somehow keep hidden if that makes any sense whether you know i've heard you know interdimensional they could be interdimensional creatures or they could be this or that and and so yeah it's just interesting the whole the whole thing is just I love that. I love that part of the paranormal. That's for sure. I know it. It's so fun. And growing up, I heard so much about, well, what got me involved rather in the paranormal and, and UFOs are books about cryptids and all that sort of stuff. Because, you know, I really hated to read growing up, but mm -hmm. books about Bigfoot and ghosts, it really just sparked my interest to improve my reading yeah. And to follow further into these sort of subjects. Finally, I, well, as a kid, I thought, man, finally, there's a subject that I actually like reading about, opposed to all the other stories I thought were just so boring. Right. And I, I was, I'm right there with you. You yeah, were like I, that too. I had a hard time with reading stuff, but anything paranormal, I, I just, I just clung on to it. So, though I right. remember as a child when I, when I wasn't allowed to talk too much about what was going on in my house and, and I was so interested in it, our local library had those, um, those time life books, the, the black ones that, you know, went through all the different things of paranormal. And, and I think I read each one of those volumes 20 times when I was a kid, just to, just because I loved it so much. Yeah. See, because we, I'm not sure if what the reading program was for, kids when you were growing up but we were forced to read every day 30 minutes a day yeah i'm not sure if that's what you guys had over there but i would always be reading some sort of paranormal or ufo book yeah yep uh that was that was that was me too i i anything i could get a hold of whether it was ufos or bigfoot or ghosts or really anything cool. like that i'm so, yeah. read, so so glad that you had the same sort of upbringing as i did and another cryptid that I do still have a little issue with is the Loch Ness Monster. Yes. That, yeah, that one seems Nessie to... is kind of hard to fully support and back, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I, I would agree with that. That one's, that one's really kind of tough, uh, especially when, you know, you find out that the main picture that everybody used and pointed to for years and years ends up being, you know, fake uh, with the 
the sub the toy submarine and and so yeah that one's a little bit harder especially this far in day and age of not being able to find it so yet there's still people that spend so much money to go search for it yeah yeah that's true um and and i i know you know there's a lot of lakes that that have monsters in fact <laughs> oddly enough one not far from here in northern utah bear uh, bear lake has the bear lake monster which is one they've talked about uh, for forever but um uh, in fact there's a story in my second book it's not about the bear lake monster but it's about um an individual who it was actually uh, his great great grandfather came out of his journal and he talked about uh, seeing uh, he he was in charge of as a teenager hooking up the horses and um going down to the lake and hauling up the logs that they would cut and float around the lake and so he had just hauled up two logs from the lake and unhooked the horses and he looked down and there were two more logs and he was just couldn't believe he'd missed them so he hooked the horses up and got went back down the hill but when he got down there they weren't logs they were fish um extremely large fish and his description sounded very similar to a sturgeon but there's never been any official sturgeon in that lake but um it's interesting though that uh water monsters are also part of the paranormal that is very true uh very strange different Creatures have been reported in different lakes, much different than the Loch Ness Monster. And my goodness, are are you ready for Halloween, by the way? Oh, yes. I love Halloween. <laughs> I, so do I. I. I just had to. I couldn't resist. I had to bring it up to you because I felt you definitely are one of those people that go and just try to live it up with their child. Yes. Oh, yeah. We have a lot of fun. Um, Perfect. My, uh, my youngest, he's 11 now, and... um he just, he loves my books. He loves actually helping me, you know, try and find, yeah, he'll come to me and say, Oh, I heard this story. We gotta, we gotta hunt it down, you know, find out if it's true. And, and uh, he just loves it. Uh, it's just wonderful that he's excited about it too. And, and he loves Halloween and all the things that go on with the, the, you know, haunted forests and just all the different stuff they have that go on here in the valley is, it's a pretty amazing. Oh, yeah, no doubt. I would imagine lots of people get into it, especially in a smaller town. I would say there's probably even uh, various carnivals that go on for, for the children out there. Oh, yeah, there's all kinds of stuff like that. And uh, Oh, by the way, uh, in terms of Halloween and trick-or-treating, mm -hmm. um, what's it like out there for your town? Do the, I guess, the parents, do they allow their children to actually – go and enjoy trick-or-treating or is it more a pc like it is out here where i live where the kids they go trick-or-treating during the day they're not there at night time and it's a mess it doesn't resemble it it doesn't resemble like even 10 percent of the sort of halloween i used to have back when i was growing up and even in high school i remember halloween was so much more fun and exciting mm -hmm. and lively and now it's just turned into a big mess. You know, we've had this thing out here, and I don't know if it's just here, but it's it's called Trunk or Treat, and for a long time it's kind of ruined it. Oh, uh, no. People would go to a parking lot, uh, the centralized parking lot, and just open up the trunk of their car, and the kids would just go around and get the candy from the cars, and it was done and, you know – half an hour and then nobody gave out candy at the house and that went on for years but i think the last couple years people have kind of gone in the area gone back to kids going to the house and um and trying to make it a little bit more fun for the kids so uh but yeah definitely not the same as when i was a kid i know it's so different it is it is and and i'm afraid you know there's a lot of things that have happened with, you know, scare tactics where people, yeah. parents are afraid of letting their kids do it, which is too bad because it is because a lot of that stuff didn't end up being true. The stuff that, you know, razor blades and candy and oh stuff my God, never yes. ended up being <laughs> true stories anyway. So. How did that even begin? I don't know. I don't know. It's uh, urban legend stuff. Lord. Yeah. That, that sounds like a, uh, what's that woman's name? Nancy Grace. Oh yeah. Sounds like yeah. one of those stories. 
Yeah, one of those stories. That she, yeah, exactly. Good. Good. I, I, I don't even have the words. Right. It's just turned into something completely bastardized, in my opinion. Oh, I agree. Yeah, I definitely agree. I would just, I would love that whole week leading up, well, the whole entire month, rather, rather of Halloween was just so much fun. Mm-hmm. You had all these people having these haunted houses. You had, oh, um, yeah. My local theater, what they used to do, we, we had this, we used to have this large, huge building, a very old uh, movie theater in my area before they shut it down. Mm-hmm. They used to have the upstairs area just closed off and it would be, turned into this elaborate haunted house like oh, wow. a like a maze and it was incredible it was so much fun and i'm thinking man the kids down here they <laughs> they would have just absolutely loved this sort of experience and now since everything got so pc in america yeah it's just it's it's been completely destroyed and it's so sad to see in my opinion because yeah. I, I get so much uh nostalgia when i think about halloween yeah. And man, I, I just feel so bad for the kids now. I do, yeah. I <laughs> They've been robbed. Yeah, yeah. And and when a, a little girl wants to dress up like her favorite uh you know, Disney princess and and then people have to have a giant discussion about whether it's appropriate or not, and it it's just kinda sad for the kids, that's for sure. Oh yes. <laughs> oh yes. I didn't even know if that was an issue going on right now, but I would imagine, sure. In the times yeah. we live in, I'm sure it bothered someone. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's that's the problem. That's the problem. But yeah. But we 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 have a lot of things that go on in in our little valley. Uh, they do ghost tours um, because the main street's so old, and there's a lot of ghost stories involved there. So they do ghost tours, and um, the university, uh, Utah State, they do a lot of fun things leading up to it too, and and so, yeah, Halloween's actually pretty fun. It's it, the trick or treating and stuff might not be the same, but you know, it's starting to come back. I think a little bit. Right on. And another question for you, John, is: Do you prefer stories of the paranormal or more along the lines of, let's say, like a cryptid? You know, I I like I I like them both, and I and I love investigating both of them. Uh, if somebody's willing to share their story with me, I you know I'll take it. Uh, in this, in my last book, I have a section even, it's called, um, I call it Glitches in the Matrix. And it's stories that, uh, wouldn't fall into any of the other categories. It's mm. something that, that happened that right. doesn't make sense. And so, you know, I, I take all different stories of the paranormal. I just love, love it all, honestly. Have you experienced deja vu? I have, yes. Isn't that weird? It is. It is. It's really weird. It makes you wonder what's going on. It really does. And what about, I guess, premonition? Yeah. Yep. Um, I've experienced premonition before, and I know people who have. Um, that's also really kind of a, you know, strange thing, uh, how it's connected or, you know, it, it's, it, it's just that. And it's amazing to me that there's so much more out there than what we can necessarily see with our eyes. Agreed. And what about in terms of outer body experiences, John? Have you ever had the pleasantry of having one of these? You know, I haven't. I've never had one of those before. It's so. freaky. It, I don't think you'd want one. <laughs> yeah, I've heard. I've heard. Uh, I've never had that, and I've never had uh, sleep paralysis. Sleep paralysis is also uh, kind of a scary thing. So. Oh yeah. Also known as old hag syndrome, which I did experience growing up when I oh. was young. Ooh, yeah. I couldn't yell. I couldn't get up. But of course, I didn't see some sort of weird entity. Of course, I just, mm-hmm. I, I just, I really wanted to get up out of, off of bed. But it felt like somebody was just weighing me down Ooh. Uh, and my wrists and and my and my ankles, mm-hmm. and I couldn't scream. Ooh, that would be really scary. Right. It, they are. Really yeah, that, it is a very terrifying experience, and lots of Americans. Well, not just Americans. Everyone around the world, they they go through this sort of experience as well. Right. It's it's a very ancient sort of tale mm-hmm. that does exist. It goes back to the jinn. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I've I, I've heard that. That's that's really scary. It is. It's it's, it's really weird to have some sort of Middle Eastern type entity visit you. And mm-hmm. I I had a dream, and I described this thing, and a friend of mine basically said you described the 
prototype of a gin, basically. Oh, wow. Yeah. Ooh. Kind of weird, yes. And I did wake up with, um, so it felt like somebody was choking me, and that's why I woke up from my, from the dream. Yeah. Oh, that would be definitely scary. Yeah. And I've, I've, oh, I've freaked me out. Who've had interesting <laughs> things like that happen to them that scary things like that. So. Oh, yeah. And who really knows what the hell that sort of thing was or what brought that sort of thing into, uh, the dream state, but lots of these entities, that's how they sort of, pass through through the astral plane yeah yeah exactly so it it's it's interesting how you know different entities interact with us um good bad you know indifferent so it really is it really is and of course i am curious i'm always very curious john (laughs) but I, i i do want to ask you about films and and such in terms of the paranormal and UFOs, it seems like Hollywood has ran out of ideas. And I talked about this with the first guest, and I I just can't stop thinking how terrible movies are today when it comes to taboo subjects like this. Yeah, it it, it really is. It's hard to find a really good uh, movie that I guess that 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 tells the story properly. I guess you could say. Um, I, I I can't remember. I saw a movie not too long ago, and I saw it with my daughter, and she loves scary mo- movies. And we walked out, and she's just like, "Didn't that scare you?" And I said, "Well, no, it really it didn't. It was kind of silly, you know what I mean, with with the way it was telling the story and and the way it it because the paranormal's not really like that. And so, yeah, I I completely agree with you on that. They, the, the they last... kind of lost their way. Right, right. I I agree, and. To just tag on that more and to really nail it in, you you would think those in Hollywood, all the great minds, they would come up with something original, yet they just keep rehashing the same old formula. That's just right. garbage. Right, exactly. And it's, it's funny you mention that because my wife and I went and saw a movie not too long ago. I won't say the name, but it was about <laughs> a giant shark. Oh, okay. You didn't <laughs> and- like that. Yeah, and and I walked out of there shaking my head, and I said, you know, that they have all this CGI, and that movie can't hold a candle to Jaws, which was made what thirty five years ago. You know, oh, well, it's, it's of, Jaws. It's a classic. Yeah, it's you can't a really beat Jaws. Oh, Everyone loves yeah, Jaws. So yeah, it's just interesting that they rehash, but they, they even tend to make things worse when they do. And I love movies. Um, that's one thing. Um, my wife and I absolutely love movies, but oh, fantastic. there are times that I just walk out when it comes to monster movies or or paranormal, and I just kind of shake my head. So, well, what about horror films? Since we are coming up uh, close to Halloween, this is the time where I really start watching nothing but horror films. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm actually actually excited for. We'll we'll see, but the new Halloween, the new, one, yeah, 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 that, that's coming out with Jamie Lee Curtis, kind of the the addition to the old school one. So, and that's what that's directed by Rob Zombie this time, right? I think so. I think so. Okay. Or he did the last one. I can't remember, but yeah, yeah. I just saw the preview for that, and I'm kind of looking forward to that one. Me too. Okay. I um, definitely, so. I definitely want to see something new uh, come out now. Mm-hmm. Even though it's again, it's a rehashing of an old story. Right. It's still, yeah. it's still, uh, it, it, it's still something that's classic, though. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's kind of taking your classic, and so we'll see. Hopefully, they they pay homage and yet do something good with it. So, indeed, indeed, and of course, in terms of any new books, are you going to write anything? Uh, yeah, I'm actually, I'm already working on my next one. Uh, it'll probably won't be out again for, uh, you know, eight, nine months because it's in the early stages. But um, I have the two books out now, uh, Stranger Bridgerland and then Beyond Stranger Bridgerland, which is the second one. And uh, so, yeah, and, and with the more that my books have gotten out, the more I have people coming to me to tell their stories. And, and the area that it covers is just getting bigger and bigger. Uh with the stories. So it, it's just been a great journey actually. So fantastic. I'm, I'm glad that things are looking up for you and you're getting some interesting customers out there. Yeah. And you're meeting these people and they're reading your book and they're emailing you and 
Mm-hmm. It's working out for you. In other yeah, words. it's been great. I, I, I've loved it. I didn't realize that it would take off as much as it has after my first book. Uh, but it's just wonderful. It's been great. And of course, we are coming to a close very soon here. I, I definitely don't want to take up too much of your time, John. No so, you know, I'm so glad you can join us here and it's been such a fun ride so far. Yeah, it's been awesome. I appreciate it. It's been such, I love how you're, you're very organic with your, with your, uh, interviews. It's great. It's got to be real, John. You can't just script everything. No, exactly. And even if you do, the notes always go out the window if you're good. Yeah. Yes, they do. All right. And here's the last, some of the last stuff I wanted to get through with you, John, was in terms of the afterlife. How do you feel about the afterlife and how do you perceive it? Um, yeah, I definitely believe in an afterlife. Um, I, I've had, uh, and opportunities where, uh, individuals who have passed on, I have had the opportunity to, I guess you could say speak with them. So I do believe that there's an afterlife and I do believe that loved ones, uh, carry on that love and have the opportunity to look after us from the other side. Uh, I think that, um, <clears throat> whatever you call your, you know, uh, the great spirit or however it is that you refer to it, uh, is definitely loving and that understanding and, uh, is much more, I guess you could say generous, uh, judge because whoever, whoever it is, is, uh, yeah, no, understands our path like nobody else. Understood. And John, I do want to thank you so much for being a part of the program. It's been a terrific time. And go ahead and plug anything you'd like before you descend. Okay. Uh, yeah, my two books, uh, Stranger Bridgerland, Beyond Stranger Bridgerland. Um, my website is uh, just uh, www.strangerbridgerland.com. And uh, if any of your listeners have a story that they would like to share with me, there's a place on the website to get a hold of me and contact me. And I always enjoy speaking and talking to people about the paranormal. Amazing. Thank you so much, John. We'll have to do this again. And mahalo, my friend. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Godspeed. Take care, John. Thank you, Michael. You too. Bye-bye. My goodness, that was Mr. John Olson, and of course, I'm joined yet by a very special, very special soul, Brig. Oh my God, I can't believe you're here. I'm here, Michael. Can you believe it, Brig? Here we are again. It's just wow, like old times. It really is. Like it's like we're fighting back in the trenches again, right? Oh, we are fighting in the trenches. Oh my God, I can't believe it, Brig. How the hell are you, by the way? I'm I'm great. It's so yeah. good to hear you here. Oh my God! Someone pinch me. I'm so glad Brig can finally be here. The one and only Brig. Wow. Are you Are you surprised? I really am because it's late, and I know you're not one to normally stay up at this hour. So I I think that's amazing. Well, I made coffee, and I listened to your guests. Oh my God! And I yeah, I enjoyed them. And uh, you know that uh, ghosts and aliens aren't my field of interest. Right. But but I did enjoy them. And I, I especially liked the second fellow with his ghost story. That was really nice. Yeah, he was a nice man, huh? Yes, he seemed like a nice man. Yeah, he's a nice man. I, I like him a lot. He He's a nice man. Well, you know, I, I as I listened to both of them, I was thinking that they would like um, – a particular forum that I hang around on. Oh, yes. My goodness. Uh, indeed, indeed. And during the whole first uh, guest I brought on here. Yes. Did, did you, did you like her? Um, well, um, she was very informative about aliens and, um, she was speaking about, uh, the children of the lie. I believe. Oh yeah, the children of the lie. I'm so glad she was able to fend away from from those out there, the children of the lie. I'm glad she, yeah, I'm glad she recognized them for the people who they are, yes. which is the children of the lie. Their father is Satan. Yes, 
That's what I understand. Oh, yeah. And isn't it amazing, Brig, that here we are on, on under a whole new umbrella? On a night like this, on the, am I allowed to say it? You can say it. I, I, I am just thrilled to have my voice going out over the L&M network. Oh, my goodness. Isn't it tremendous with, with uh, Michael Vera and, and Gary the Mad Martian? Oh, my God. It's fantastic. It's insane, right? It is. I Who, mean, and I'm what just thought. excited. I'm just thrilled. I can't believe it. It's it's tremendous. This is something he did prophesize back in 2014, and the pieces are sto- uh, are slowly, very slowly, starting to fall into place. I love the Mad Martian, and I am just so happy that I get to talk to you early on in your new venture on this new network. I know. It, it's really incredible. I, I can't believe it. Yes, in years to come, we will be able to say that I was one of the early ones. Exactly. You were one of the founders of it all. <laughs> and I'm so glad you're someone who supported the program for such a long time, back when no one really else believed in the program. And here we are, 2018, just barely starting to... Uh, breakthrough, very, very little. I always believed in you, Michael. You were one of the first programs that I talked about and praised on my little show that I had back then called Gabbing Now. Gabby Now, that's right. Historic. Love those videos, too. Oh, yes, they're historic. They really are. It's like a trip back through time when I see those videos. Indeed. Amazing. Now, yes, they they made my fame. And, and, of course, you are very famous. It's very true. And, of course, yes. there was another dark matter I thought we could sort of lightly go over. Sure. I, I saw something that, you know, it was it was something very interesting that happened recently on, on another community out there. Yes. Uh, a place where you see the lack of moral character. You can ask me anything, Michael, and... I will answer to the best of my ability, but keep in mind that I do not want to hurt the feelings of the sensitive souls in that community. So Very I true. will answer carefully. Yes, we, we do not want to bully them too much or no, even bully them want, at all. Yeah, we don't want to make them cry. We don't because we did learn that there are those out there who are extremely sensitive, but that's okay. Yes. We We do not have any hate or anger in our hearts at all for these individuals? No, only understanding. Correct. And what I was going to mention was this dark matter. I had gone into a certain form out there, and, you know, I was messing around and having a good time, you know, doing doing what I do best. Yes. And I realized I, I angered an uh, individual out there who is this, uh, I guess you could say, this bald-headed, plain Jane, low testosterone individual, beta male. I I recognize someone by that description. Right, and what he doesn't realize is that I was merely trying to understand where he is psychologically, and I was proven exactly where he was in terms of his mentality and his unhappiness, and it really made it clear that this individual is nothing but a follower of the children of the lie. Your mission was successful. I believe it was, and it really showed to me that this individual was very angry and nasty and proved that his father is Satan. And, of course, well, yeah, and, I, of course, they got very angry with me, and, of course, I was banned right away. I'm sorry, Michael. It's okay. It's okay. I was merely enjoying myself, having fun, trying to make others laugh and, you know, lead them to salvation is basically what I was doing. Well, you know, this is the balance of life. What makes joy and happiness for one makes anger and unhappiness for another. And I agree 100%. And it's just so telling to see someone act this way. And yes. I, I knew that the anger and hatred came out from their hearts. Well, 
as it's soon as childish. they, it is childish. childish. It is, yeah. it is, and I agree. Yeah. It was childish on my part to sort of bait this individual to reveal who they really are. Well, how how could you have suspected such a reaction? Oh, of course, most people already know what I was doing. Um, but this is a good way to get a feel of an individual and where they are psychologically. And it, well, it was very sad to see because this individual got very angry with me and even to a point where they threatened to call my mom. And the entire time I thought, well, you know, it's interesting that you say that because my mom wouldn't be very interested in talking to a third rate paranormal host. Well, I'm just happy that if you felt the need to repent for any pain that you had caused any sensitive individuals, I know, that you yes. knew that you could talk to me about it. And I do forgive you, Michael. I know. I'm, I'm glad that you can forgive me. And I forgive them, too, because, you know, I say these things with with just love in my heart. There, there's no hatred. There's no anger. And it's interesting to see the, these sort of indi individuals out there, and it always proves my point that lots of people are angry and lots of them are followers of the children of the lie. Well, you know, I think that um, it, it's not even unique to one group of people or another anymore. I think it's 99% of the people fall into this category where they just – they see other people's um, uh, transgressions, but they're blind to their own. Agreed. And, yes, and they can be doing a thing with one hand and not even knowing what their other hand is going to do in five minutes. I, I saw an, an example this afternoon where, and I won't mention any names, but an individual was invited to speak. And they were told they were in a very secure environment. And the next thing you know, everything that they said is all over the Internet. Now, the whole Internet is not a small group of friends. No, it's not. It's not a place of, of friendship. There's lots of people, lots of parasites out there that are conspiring to do lots of damage. Well, that's – what I'm trying to say is this is an example of where loving hearts are trying to help someone, but ultimately it doesn't necessarily help. That's right. And going back to this angry individual who did prove that father, that his father is Satan, he, he really did prove that to me. But that's okay. You know, he could overcome these issues, and I'm glad we're talking about it. The, the anger and hatred, he, he could definitely overcome. I believe in him. Um, the spirit of his mother basically came out through him, through his anger. Uh, he was emotional like a woman. And men, they don't get emotional that way because men are men and women are women. And men normally do not behave like that. So it was the spirit of the woman in him that was coming out. But he can overcome that spirit. It, it, it happens, and I forgive him. You know, at some time in the future, you'll have to explain. I don't understand that much about this belief system, but um, I see it around me. Understood, yes. You see the, the anger and the nastiness. Yes, I do. Right, and you see it with uh, that nasty Maxine Waters out here in California, too. She's just yes, nasty. Yes, I do. Yeah, she's just nasty and hateful. Yes, You'll have to explain all this to me one day, Michael. No doubt, I will. I will definitely explain all these things I speak of. And of course, Brig, we had this interesting conversation about society and the Me Too movement. Oh, don't get me started, Michael. I know, but you know, we, we How have could to. You? <laughs> yes, it's very interesting to see this. Uh, so many emotional women and indecisiveness. And again, I understand many women can overcome these things. The last well, 10 years, however, women have been sort of reduced to this sort of PC influence by peers and social media and television. And what they see and emulate is what is perceived and acceptable by the social norm. It makes one understand why women were not allowed to vote. Yeah, very controversial. You even saying that a lot of women out there would not like that sort of theory. 
I, I, I realized that, Michael, I, I shouldn't have said that I may have hurt some sensitive individuals. There might be, I apologize. Yeah. There might be some sensitive women listening to this now. Who oh, can't I'm take sorry. That. It's okay. They, can, they will forgive you. Can you erase that part? No, I think we have to leave it in for shock value. All right. I'm, so, I'm sorry, Michael. I'll try <laughs> not to do that again. Understood. And I'm, I'm so glad you're here, Brig. Because Are you? I am, I am, because we could finally have this talk about society and, and the way all these things are going. And, of course, we, we have to talk about Harvey Weinstein and what your thoughts and opinions are on this right here. Um, it's very interesting to see, especially what's going to happen with the actors and comedians out there who were affected by this. Will they resume work? Um, what's going to happen is just a thought in my mind. Michael, when I don't know, I have to say I don't know because I just don't know. I can't even imagine. I, I would like to contribute something to that, but at this point, I just feel like I don't know. And that's perfectly fine and a valid answer to say you don't know. It's okay. It really is. I just can't believe how how much society has really changed over the past 10 years. I say this all the time on my program, but I can't really help but not notice all the change. And it's not a positive change. It's a very negative change. It seems like there is a war on masculinity. Yes. it does. Well, you know, you asked me about the Me Too movement. I do have some very strong feelings about that. I, I do wonder that somebody hasn't cashed in on um, an, uh, a fashion brand called Ugly Fashions or Unsexy Fashions and um, Ugly Cosmetics. You know, I, I mean, if, if women don't want to be attractive to men, then, you know, they, they could design fashions and makeups that will make them unattractive. Why don't they try that? And I agree with you on that. And there's another individual out there named Tess Holliday. And she's this plus-size model. Yes. And she's very big. And she's basically famous for being very big. Yes. And I'm just wondering why would America really get behind that sort of lifestyle when it's completely unhealthy for you? Why try to glamorize it? And put it in front of magazines. I don't really know what's so empowering of seeing a woman of this nature looking so unhealthy in front of ma- in, in, in public like this. I just don't know what's going on. Uh, the values in this country have just dwindled, in my opinion. Well, it's a contradiction because on one hand, we are to strive to be healthy. We are even almost to punish people who do not strive to be healthy. But on the other hand, we have this, we must not hurt anybody's feelings society. So we have to see everything as acceptable. So it's a contradiction. Yeah, it really is. It really is. Everyone has to have their hand held. Yes. And told that they are great. I don't like this. What happened? I don't like this PC sort of society we've come to mesh with brig i just i don't know what happened i'm confused well it's 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 more than that it's like we're being forced to try to mesh with it it's a fascism a sort of regime that america is certainly going into and i would like to tag that with the fact that during my conversation with katie hopkins i told her this country is going to end up very much like yours referring to the UK. I'm afraid so. I don't like it. You know, it's like um when they when they told us that um well there was this master race that was to be selected and preserved and brought forward into history um that was imagined by some to be a necessity to happen in the future. And it almost seems like even though Everybody believed that that was a bad idea. It almost happened to us without us even noticing it. Do you think society can be restored and made better, Brig? 
Well, I have spoken with many wise persons, and the general opinion is that perhaps in 200 years, if the mind of mankind goes in the right direction. But that said, it does not appear that the mind of mankind is going in the right direction. Yeah, that's a great and that answer. Is, that is the synopsis of many great minds that I have spoken with over the decades. Yes, and of course, I also want your opinion. You, you can disagree with me, Michael. You don't have to say yes. Oh, no, I wasn't disagreeing with you, actually. And it's but funny. But you can. But yeah, you can. I understand. And that's something I was just telling the last guest that. I did hear that. <laughs> yes, you're able to disagree with me. And I don't disagree with you. I think you are on the right path. But we can disagree and still be the greatest of friends. Of course. And that's what I would like everyone out there to know. Just because we don't agree. I'm talking about the listener. Even if we don't agree, you, you can always still call in and we can talk about these things and what you don't agree with. I'm always here to have these sort of confrontations or conversations, whatever you want to make of it, because I come from a place with no anger in my heart. And I and that that means I have no fear, because when you get rid of the anger and the hate, the fear goes away. It does. And it's incredible. Lots of people out there are still immature. They really don't understand the way the world works lots of individuals out there that have the anger and the hate that we see uh, the third rate paranormal hosts out there um the thing is once they go to bed every night they are some of the most miserable and lonely people in the universe and well, they will this, suffer this is why so many people are on prescription medications to go to sleep that's right and to stay calm yeah and, and break not by the way, how's your arthritis? Because I know that was one thing that is popular and, you know, it hurts some people that are very soft and sensitive and well, you've had it for such a long time. Yes, I've had it for 34 years and um, I, I've had many doctors that have prescribed pain medications for me, but I don't take them. I just feel like that if I start to take them, then I'll need to take them. So I don't. I do the best I can on the days when it's bad and don't worry about it on the days when it isn't. Understood, Brig. And, of course, this leads me to ask you again, since you are on my show, which covers all sorts of topics that are for everyone and their mama, I'm yes. curious. You definitely are not so much in tune with the paranormal and, and UFOs, that sort of thing. It's not really your forte, right? I am really sorry to say, Michael, that I've heard so much of it that, and, and I don't believe in any of it. Understood. But I do like a good ghost story for Halloween. It's still fun. You know, yeah. Yeah, it, it's fun, but it's not something that I spend much of my time. Right, you know, right. It, it, is, to. it is very hacky to be a paranormal host where that's basically all you do is talk about the paranormal. I think that is very hacky, in my opinion. That's just my opinion. I, I could be wrong. You could disagree. It's okay. The world will not end. Well, I like shows like um, that teach me about something that I haven't heard of before, some new discoveries, um, speculations about things that I uh, haven't heard about before. Um, Philosophical ideas, social ideas, um, you know, th those are the topics. Ancient history, right. I still like to um, uh, learn about that because we still do learn more about it as we go forward. Very true. Very true. We do learn a lot from the ancient past and definitely we're able to apply it to what we know now. And we gain all this information and knowledge from those, yes. from the, from the echoes of the fallen. And they all believed in spirits and aliens oh, yeah. and all of that in ancient right. history. But I still think to myself that if a child, a young child had not heard about these concepts from, um, their parents and their neighbors and all of that, that, um, 
if if I hadn't been born and taught a concept of an alien and taught a concept of a god, I don't think I would have formulated one on my own. Understood, understood. And Brig, when you were just a little girl, yes, were you raised in a religious household, Brig, or not? Yes, oh, I were. was born in a Roman Catholic home. And do you still follow the children of the light? Um, no, in fact, I was very troublesome. And um, then a, a, a point came when the church started to change, and my parents were very shocked about it. And my mother said, how did you know? And I said, well, I don't know. It just didn't make sense to me. Yeah. Understood, understood. And uh, did mom and dad ever talk about UFOs or the paranormal, anything of that nature, anything taboo? Did that ever come up at any time in your life, Brig, in your uh, adolescence, ad an early adulthood, anything like are you, that? Are you psychic, Michael? N I've been told that. Well, my mother did see a ghost. Okay, here we go. What did mom see? Well, we were... It was around Halloween, and uh, we were sitting around the living room fireplace. Uh, my father had brought in logs, and the flames were all aglow. And we had these French doors that looked out onto a glassed-in porch. And my mother looked up from her knitting. Yes, she was a knitting cat lady. And she saw this man with one of those uh, Dick Tracy hats on, uh -huh. looking in through the windows at us. Scary. Oh. Oh, my yes, God. Yes, very scary. Oh, my Lord. Yes. We didn't see it, but she did. But she did. Yeah. Yes. And, you know, that's so and, weird that you bring that up. I'm sorry to just definitely just bounce in here, but I, I got to mention this quickly to you. When I was maybe five, six years old, I had spent the night over at my grandparents' house. And I slept in the room with my my uncle and another one of my cousins. It was some sort of get-together, I remember. And we were asleep maybe around, might have been 1 or 2 a.m. And I recall that all of us heard this really evil laughter that came from outside. And we saw some shadow walk by. And we don't know what the hell that was, but it was a very strange and unusual laughter that came from this strange shadow figure outside the window, and we never figured out who the hell it was. But it was a laughter that we've never heard before. It was no one from our family, that's for sure. Don't know what the hell that was. Oh, did I lose you, Brig? We might have lost Brig here. Can you hear me now? Oh, there you are. What happened? I think I had my mute button muted. Oh, that sounds like me. Yeah, I do that often. Well, um... All right, so I'll continue my story. Yes, go ahead. My mother, my mother looked up and saw this ghost as I described him to you. And, um, the rest of us, my brother, my father, and I looked through the windows and we did not see a ghost. But my mother was very, very frightened. So my father said, don't worry, dear. I will go out and make sure that everything's all right. So my dad got, it was winter time, of course, because the fire was ablaze. And he got his boots on, and he went out back, and there were no footprints in the snow. Oh, my. I'm sure that must have really helped you sleep the coming years. It didn't worry me, but it worried my mother. My she God. was always looking around after that to see if there was a ghost peeking in the window at her. That is very freaky. Yes. Yeah, I don't like that story. It's a scary story. It is, actually. I'm thinking about it now. I don't like that sort of thing, especially recently, Brig. There's been reports of, I'm not sure who they are, but there's been reports of people trying to break in cars and going into people's backyards where I live. So I'm just imagining that now, and I'm just thinking, wow, I, I hope that doesn't happen uh, where I'm at. Oh, wow. Well, you think that's bad? We had a drive-by shooting right in front of my building. Did you? Yes, we did. Well, I'm certainly glad you're not hurt. I was inside. Oh, thank God. Yeah. I want to get shot. I mean, that that's one of the worst ways to go out. Well, it was a time I would have normally been outside after lunch, enjoying the fresh air. But for some reason, 
Well, you know, that arthritis thing I was telling you about. Sure. It just, it just wasn't a day for that. So that's why I always say, um, if something's wrong, it's for a good reason. So for that reason, because of my arthritis, I wasn't outside that day. Understood. And isn't it amazing that nowadays you have to worry about being shot? That's where we are in society, especially um, the school children. If you're a parent, you have to worry about your kid being shot now. Well, Jesus, I, I was coming home. I walk everywhere. So I was coming home from the store and um, I bought something that was in a rather large box. And I also do use one of those walkers with a seat on it when I have to walk quite a way in case, you know, I have to sit down for a moment or two. So I, I, they were going to bring the box to my house, but I said, well, I can set it on my seat and just take it home myself and save you the trouble, although it's very nice of you to offer. And um, so they let me take it home myself. And because I had that box on my seat, the woman that came out of the store behind me, she got robbed of her wallet. Oh, no. Some people came rushing right in front of that store. And they took her wallet right out of her hand, her purse and everything. And because I had that box on my walker, it wasn't me. Do you understand what I'm saying, Michael? Understood, yes. Very fortunate. Yes. And it's it's a terrible story, and I feel bad that that happened. Yes. My God. Well, Brig, we definitely are running out of time. I'm looking at the clock here. And, again, I do want to thank you for being a part of the program. You spent a good deal of time with me here and I I can't thank you enough I know you're not usually awake at this hour well I thank you for letting me be on your show and letting me be on the L&M network oh yes fantastic any final words before I let you go praise MV understood okay Brig thank you so much and we'll talk very soon good night Michael all right good night mahalo bye bye And there she goes, the one and only Brig, my God. If you're listening to this on a replay, keep in mind you can listen every Saturday night at 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, 11 p.m. Eastern Time, live on the TuneIn Radio app. You have many options. You can search End of Days, and you'll find the 24-7 network, or you can go to the LNM Radio Network. Fantastic place. The people there are amazing. I I love Everyone there, even the people that don't even know that I'm there, I still love them. It's amazing. And, of course, I want to thank all of you out there for being a part of the program. I really do appreciate that. And, of course, you can go to michaeldeacon.com, click that little donate button there, and give me anything you'd like. A dollar or two is perfectly fine with me. Just keep supporting the program. I'm Michael Deacon. Thank you for listening. And with that said, the world is a mysterious place, and life itself is a mystery. Until next time, good night, everybody. the Illuminati, yet. we're not going to be behind them, but the Illuminati certainly is part of the whole thing. Right. The, the top members of the Illuminati are open to it. How appropriate. I wish I could be in that ring with Hogan right now. It's hard, oh, Granny. I'm not a Granny. I'm going to keep you real. A lot of good content. A lot of, a lot of cool topics. You know, I, yeah, I feel, you know, fortunate to have an opportunity to play. Yeah, Mr. Rusev. I do not like that, man. Just for what it's worth, I want to put in my two cents to tell you both that you have one of the most incredibly well-rounded.